everybody. It's a real pleasure having you here in Rome. Um, we have this room organized in a different way today. I hope it's comfortable for you. Uh, we speak from our seat. We don't, we don't stand up because the microphone doesn't reach us if, if we stand. Um, so I'll start my, my presentation and I'll speak uh, Italian. So I have to invite you to use the headphones. Care colleague e cari Dear colleagues, Commissioner, speakers, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, allow me to express my thanks to you all for having uh, accepted our invitation to attend the meeting of chairpersons of the committee specialized in fundamental rights. We have chosen to uh, devote to this topic the second of the interparliamentary conferences held within the framework of the Italian presidency of the EU because we feel that this is an issue with regard to which parliaments are called upon to play an active role to ensure that uh, uh, their respective governments uh, and European institutions uh, address this matter. We believe that fundamental rights are amongst those um, issues that uh, really bear witness to the true value of the European experience. Uh, and uh, this uh, is what matters in order to ensure that the process of integration may be successfully uh, completed. Furthermore, fundamental rights uh, underlie Italy, uh, Europe's uh, identity, and it is uh, no uh, coincidence. No coincidence that uh, the um, Article 2 of the um, Title 1 of the Treaty of the European Union states that the Union is founded on the values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and respect for human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. Um, and we must stress that uh, this statement... Uh, on rights precedes the uh, statements uh, contained in the subsequent uh, articles uh, under the same uh, uh, title, which uh, in state the, print the aims uh, of um, achieving uh, a single market uh, and an economic and monetary union. So fundamental rights uh, come before everything else. In terms of fundamental rights, the uh, progress achieved in Europe uh, certainly um, places us uh, in a leadership position at a global level, ensuring that fundamental rights uh, are uh, respected by candidate countries is one of the essential prerequisites for membership of the European Union. And it is... Uh, um, representing uh, one of the uh, pillars of the European Union's international activities with the growing frequency of agreements, including trade agreements uh, with third countries. We see an, um, the increasing use of so-called conditionality clauses, which goes to say conditionality clauses aimed at ensuring that uh, human rights uh, are respected in these partner countries. However, we cannot ignore the criticalities that uh, still characterize uh, our, our union and the new challenges that uh, uh, continue to emerge. And I'm referring in particular to the need for current legislation and uh, case law to be uh, truly and effectively implemented in our respective countries. It would be truly paradoxical were the European Union, which promotes uh, fundamental rights at a global level, due to inertia, 
due to inertia, I repeat, to tolerate the violation of uh, these rights uh, in member countries. This would be truly paradoxical. And this is a widespread concern which has uh, triggered a lively debate uh, and uh, has uh, been characterized by a number of different initiatives. The European Commission has proposed uh, continuous monitoring, but this demands availability of um, updated uh, information uh, which could be acquired uh, through specialized uh, organizations and bodies starting with the fundamental rights agency. Another criticality is due to the uh, long-lasting economic crisis uh, which began in 2008, which uh, could jeopardize the enjoyment of fundamental rights in uh, a number of member states. Uh, in uh, the uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights, social rights have become uh, uh, founding elements uh, for uh, guaranteeing the dignity and integrity of all uh, people. And were we to fail to promote this, so we would um, really be slipping back uh, along a path uh, which, uh, uh, with difficulties, has successfully brought us to safeguard uh, fundamental rights, uh, and this would be unacceptable. There are too many European citizens who find themselves in uh, the uh, terrible condition of not being able to enjoy fundamental rights, such as the right to health, on account uh, of uh, the uh, draconian uh, measures introduced uh, to reduce uh, um, the provisions given by by um, the healthcare services uh, due to the financial constraints stemming from membership of the monetary union. So uh, safe and uh, uh, dignified working conditions uh, are um, to be upheld uh, as indicated in uh, the Charter of Fundamental Rights, but how many European uh, citizens have been deprived of this without being able to even hope to find a new job? And uh, uh, how about the many young people who uh, have to postpone uh, their life plans uh, given the impossibility of uh, uh, finding uh, um, a stable occupation? So how are their rights being safeguarded? We think that these are objectives that uh, require certainly um, attention on the part of the European Union. Are they less important than uh, complying uh, with uh, um, the um, criteria in terms of uh, um, deficit? I would like to remind you that Article 2 of the uh, Treaty and the uh, Charter of Human Rights are binding uh, and even more uh, so than uh, the fiscal compact provisions. The third uh, criticality is linked to the persistent uh, uh, prejudices uh, and various uh, forms of discrimination that are all the more unbearable when they are addressed to the most vulnerable um, categories or when they lead to acts of violence. Um, we know that uh, there are more and more horrifying cases of violence uh, against uh, women, against uh, children, against uh, minorities, against people with disabilities, against migrants. And in this connection, with respect to migrants, dear colleagues, um, I would like to draw your attention to one point. Who are the migrants who cross the Mediterranean to reach Europe? If we look at their nationalities, we must recognize that uh, over the last few years, flows have changed. Currently, most of these migrants uh, are asylum seekers, i.e. potential refugees, people who leave their homes because they have no choice. And most of those who reach Europe uh, by sea are fleeing from Syria, Eritrea, Sudan or Somalia. They're fleeing wars and persecutions. They come 
to request asylum, to request protection. Asylum is another right. It is a fundamental right which is uh, um, recognized uh, by our national legislations uh, at times. It uh, is also recognized by our constitutions and they do this. Um, entrusting their lives to smugglers, uh, risking their lives, because as things stand at the moment, uh, there is no alternative to the Mediterranean, which has become a, something of a Russian roulette, a gamble. And this being the case, it is clear that a joint common effort uh, is required. And it is uncertain that Italy is playing its role with the Mare Nostrum operation, but um, rescue and aid uh, is something that Europe as a whole must uh, take on board. And the issue of rescue at sea must be Europeanized because the Mediterranean uh, border is a European border. There's a fourth element uh, which I would like to draw your attention to, and it has to do with the issue of digital uh, communication and relative rights to digital communication. The United Nations uh, recognizes uh, the right to the internet as a human right. So if on the one hand the web um, offers extraordinary opportunities uh, for um, exchanges, uh, uh, knowledge and uh, economic uh, exchanges, it, it does expose users to possible abuses, fraud uh, or violations of the right to uh, privacy. In some cases, uh, there have been uh, severe violations uh, which uh, were particularly heinous because uh, they uh, depended on uh, bodies that uh, are reported to um, um, foreign uh, countries. And in this case, the um, overarching aim of the European Union's action should be that of guaranteeing the respect of uh, human rights and dignity, safeguarding the most vulnerable subjects in particular, as was pointed out by the European Court of Justice in a recent uh, uh, judgment. This must occur without, of course, jeopardizing uh, um, security and market uh, possibilities and opportunities. The Italian Chamber of Deputies is still uh, working on this topic. We have set up an ad hoc committee with um, experts on this topic and uh, members of parliament who are particularly active on these issues. And this committee has uh, drawn uh, up uh, a statement of principles uh, pertaining to the rights and duties uh, in the internet. Uh, on the 27th of October, we will launch uh, an open public consultation so as to ensure that um, citizens uh, and the uh, different stakeholders may participate as actively as possible. Today, we will be um, circulating a first version of this uh, um, charter, which uh, uh, will be the focus of the debate that will take place in the second session of our meeting. The idea of establishing uh, a committee to study these aspects within a Parliament, uh, and this is something that we've already seen in other European countries such as France, Germany, uh, the United Kingdom, stems from the awareness that to consider the Internet as one of the many media is reductive and inappropriate. The Internet, uh, you see, is much more than that. It is uh, an essential dimension for the present and the future of our societies. It is a dimension which uh, in uh, only a few years uh, has made for great opportunities for freedom, growth and democratic participation. And this means that all, especially Parliament, uh, have uh, a very specific responsibility to contribute uh, effectively so as to finally uh, be able to adopt uh, a Charter of Rights uh, for the Internet. I very much hope that you will be willing to um, take this document into consideration and contribute your ideas and proposals. We are fully aware that um, an action of this kind cannot uh, obviously uh, 
be effective if it is conducted only at a national level or even at a European level, given the very nature of uh, uh, the web, uh, which, as we know, obviously um, knows no boundaries. In conclusion, dear colleagues, the matters that we can discuss in the course of our meeting are many and also very challenging. I am confident that interparliamentary cooperation, when it is based on an exchange of uh, opinions, uh, um, on a frank and open uh, basis, exchanging experience and best practices can really and truly enable the European Union uh, to make uh, a significant step forward. Thank you very much for your attention. Do adesso la parola al Presidente del I'd like now to give the floor to the presiding officer of the Senate. Uh, Pietro Grasso. President Boldrini, authorities, um, distinguished guests, dear colleagues, it's a great pleasure to extend a, a greeting uh, to you on my behalf and the Italian Senate. And uh, together, I hope that these two days of uh, discussion on uh, such uh, deep uh, issues can contribute to new, to the new uh, European Parliament and to our common future. The choice of content in the sessions, which uh, open and close the meeting, I believe, uh, offer a very clear. Uh, angle in which to understand the issue of uh, fundamental rights, um, combating exclusion and uh, fighting against discrimination. Individual rights are the uh, alpha and omega, the beginning and end of the long uh, trajectory of European integration. I think currently in this moment of dramatic disorientation and uh, deep reaching social suffering for millions of citizens, we need to first of all to think about the uh, worrying growth of inequalities even in European countries which uh, have least suffered the economic crisis, a gap between citizens which uh, distorts social cohesion, which empties democracy from the inside and uh, which makes the effectiveness of rights uh, vain delivering too many uh, people to uh, a situation of marginalization and exclusion from active citizenship. This must be our most urgent priority. We must remove these obstacles of uh, an economic and social nature which f de facto limit the freedom and equality and um, are an obstacle to the full development of people and full participation of citizens in political life. This means that uh, all citizens, but particularly young people, have to be placed in the same starting conditions and uh, each have to enjoy the same opportunities in order to be able to develop their own capabilities. But without legal protection and the oversight of uh, legitimacy, one can never ensure the effectiveness of uh, rights in uh, establishing the rule of law. Therefore, I believe that it's necessary to strengthen the efficiency, the correctness, and the homogeneity of uh, the judicial function in Europe by means of policies which um, fully establish the um, area of freedom, security, and justice, recognizing the uh, rights and new protections to European citizens without falling into uh, falling back onto anachronistic defenses of uh, national sovereignty. It's, we can no longer avoid the process of um, rapprochement, or rather homogenization of uh, criminal and uh, criminal procedural systems in uh, mem member countries and uh, extending the principle of mutual acknowledgement. We furthermore have to strengthen institutional uh, instruments which already exist, such as Eurojust and Europol, and to establish new ones, such as the European Prosecuting Office, as a structure of coordination which allows us to um, improve the level of action to um, uh, combat crimes against the financial interests in the European Union, but always in the respect of the principles of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, Convention of Strasbourg, and the Constitution Tradition of Member States. Finally, I think it's fundamental to deal with greater 
determination and coordination, both uh, in regulatory and operational terms, against uh, events and activities which weaken democracy and influence uh, politics and uh, pollute the economic and financial system in Europe, such as organized crime, corruption, and uh, the abuse of um, public uh, positions. And uh, this is also by strengthening investigations into um, assets of uh, illegal origin and also foreseeing a more extensive use of uh, confiscation, seizures, and other uh, measures uh, which can um, bring to become brought to bear against illegal uh, and uh, submerged uh, economy, which uh, obstacles the growth and uh, causes an ethical drift of institutions and democracy. Public uh, power, by means of an efficient uh, judicial system, must ensure that rights are respected and protected. If you uh, think of it, justice is the strength of the weak, of victims of the last. It is the um, protection which we can oppose to uh, abuse of uh, law, to um, oppression, to uh, the naked use of power to corruption to violence and terrorism fundamental rights do not fall from heaven they must be gained and uh, conquered and they're not given once and for all but they require on the part of citizens and institutions both individual and uh, associated and everyday commitment uh, with which to consolidate them when we speak of uh, fundamental rights, I think of a system of principles, ideas, the forms of conduct which must uh, converge towards the uh, realization of the values of the individual, the dignity of man, human rights, principles of liberty, equality, democracy, which must find a concrete um, in, um, enforcement as methods of uh, living of a form of civil living to civil form of living together as a irreplaceable asset to be defended and to be strengthened on the part of all in actual fact today the culture of images of well-being and profit at any cost leads us to think only of ourselves and uh, make us insensitive to the suffering of others ends up um, by living in a state of neutrality indifference um, and resignation but we must be careful. There is no right without a duty. There is no result without an effort. There is no victory without commitment. Rights do not come on their own. They must be um, is placed in relation with uh, the essential dues of political, economic, and social solidarity, which no citizen can evade. In a democratic system, there are no shortcuts. Any deviation from the rules means a um, a tort and uh, a mistake, an unlawful act, a offence. How many times in our lives have we found ourselves uh, in front of a face by a fork in the road? On the one hand, a favour, a uh, help, and uh, and uh, abuse of power. On the other hand, dignity, beauty, and the pride of behaving honestly, ethically, responsibly. It might seem easier and uh, more convenient to give in, but in actual fact, there is no um, coin which is worth uh, refusing uh, moral compromise, corruption, and complicity. Based on these ethical and political principles, we have the right to deal with the issue of migration, not thinking of what is most convenient, but what is right. The possible responses to these dramatic uh, emerging challenges can be summarized in uh, two key words, solidarity and responsibility. The principle of solidarity uh, means that we need to deal with the impact the phenomenon of migration has on uh, national systems in terms of balancing rights and values on the ground, weighing the needs for security and protection of uh, our countries with the promotion of uh, human dignity and fundamental rights. No legal norm can ever ignore human tragedies, uh, stories, and universal values. In this sense, the value of solidarity, which uh, recalls the relationship of all uh, political systems with citizens, 
must be combined with the principle of responsibility, which um, refers to the relationship between states. No system, no state can consider itself to be immune from the threat of terrorism and transnational crime, nor can it be considered self-sufficient uh, in uh, solving uh, global, epical questions. I um, think back to the not remote times when as uh, a um, in, as a judicial investigator, I coordinated investigations against human trafficking, um, human traffic, traffickers, the modern mer slave merchants, and often merchants of death. And I um, note the new geopolitical dimension of the migratory phenomenon, which um, has uh, undergone many deep changes and a progressive diversification of routes, the emergence of new conflicts, situations of instability, political persecution, religious persecution, and individual motivations which are turned by uh, poverty. Um, the Union cannot has to deal with this geopolitical fracture, which is at the origin of these uh, epical movements of person with a strategic vision and one which is characterized by solidarity towards the countries which are most exposed. On the legal level, the uh, union, by means of uh, the legislation and the rulings of the Court of Justice, has already established important points of convergence, thanks to directives on the condition of refugees and the granting of political assignment on uh, residence permits and on family reunion, um, uh, the conditions of entry and residence in the European uh, territory have been harmonized, but this is not enough. Today it's necessary to relaunch the European foreign policy, particularly on our eastern and southern borders in order to contribute to govern and not just um, be the passive objects of the transformations of the world geopolitical equilibrium. In a wo the world of rights, a number of issues have to be uh, dealt with, only some which have been dealt with eloquently by President Baldrini, but only some of these can be discussed in these two days. Among uh, the most um, uh, we have dealt with most recently, uh, apart from migration, rights connected to the information society, which uh, re-proposed the internal uh, aspiration towards a balance between the freedom of the individual and the security of the community. And um, we're speaking so much about the Charter of um, Information Rights, um, which uh, the uh, Chamber of Deputies is uh, discussing. Today, so much is said about European institutions, macroeconomic data, policies, failures and proposals. But the uh, institutions, um, the economy and politics are not inert material. They're made up by people and for people, and we will be able to deal with the serious issues we have before us only starting from our capability for solidarity and responsibility, from our uh, determination uh, to translate into uh, actions, ideas, and hopes, but above all, protecting human dignity without ever forgetting that we members of parliament do not only deal with uh, laws and uh, policies and uh, data, but also with uh, real uh, reality and uh, uh, humanity with a uh, beating heart. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Grasso. And now we will open the first session enforcing fundamental rights to combat exclusion and the keynote speakers are Martin Reikert, European Commissioner for Justice, Fundamental Rights and Citizenship and Judy Sunderland, Senior Researcher at uh, the Europe and Central Asia Division of Human Rights Watch. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately Due to unexpected circumstances, our colleague Claude Moraes, chairperson of the um, Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs Committee of the European Parliament is not with us. He was going to deliver an opening address, nor is Professor Saskia Saskitson with us, professor at Columbia University and uh, the London School of Economics. After the two keynote uh, addresses, uh, 
Morten Kairom, um, Director of the EU Agencies for Fundamental Rights, will illustrate uh, the annual report uh, um, of the Fundamental Rights Agency. This will be followed by a debate, uh, and each delegate uh, will, as customary, uh, depend on the number of uh, uh, requests uh, that um, uh, the chair will receive and of course we must ensure that there is sufficient time for the speakers to respond. So all colleagues wishing to um, speak during the debate are invited to hand in to the Secretariat uh, the forms that you will find in uh, your folders. Over to Commissioner Reichertz. I'm terribly sorry. I have to leave you at this point. Thank you very much, Mr. Grasso. Allora, signora so, Commissioner Reichertz has the floor. Thank you very much. I will speak French, if I may. I believe I have that possibility. Please, of course. Madam President, Chairpersons, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I am particularly honored to be with you today to talk about the values of the European Union. And I would like to thank uh, um, Madam President uh, for having pointed out that fundamental rights uh, are at the core of the uh, gender of the Italian uh, presidency of the EU. We know that this is going to probably uh, be high up on the agenda of the General Affairs Council, uh, which will be taking in November. So this is certainly an extremely important uh, um, issue. National and, and uh, supranational institutions must uh, um, work together. This is a point that was made uh, um, in her opening remarks by um, Madam President, and this is all the more so in this particular area. We have to uh, guarantee that uh, uh, we fight against uh, uh, all forms of discrimination, social exclusion, and uh, poverty. We have to promote a culture of equality, working together with continuity and determination in Europe. There are various uh, uh, important instruments uh, and uh, uh, tools to ensure the respect of human rights, democracy, and state of, uh, rule of law. We have the Council of Europe, the Convention, and the European uh, uh, Court of Human Rights. We can also count on the uh, initiatives of the European Union and its institutions and the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which uh, enshrines the constitutional uh, uh, values that are common to all members of the Union. The Charter is a binding uh, um, legal instrument, but it is also an engagement uh, for us to pursue together an objective for, for the development of our societies based on um, respect of freedom and human rights. I would like to uh, point out that Article 2 of the Union uh, reminds us uh, that uh, um, our Union is based on the respect uh, of um, democracy, human rights and rule of law. And Article 6 uh, uh, envisages uh, the accession of the European Union to the European uh, Convention on Human Rights. And I would like to remind you that we're awaiting an important decision on the part of the European Court of Justice that is, that is expected by the end of the year. We are um, engaged uh, in uh, working together to ensure that accession may occur as uh, um, soon as possible. We obviously um, make reference to national uh, legal frameworks and national institutions, and I'm delighted uh, to see that, that national parliaments are participating actively. We therefore have many uh, stakeholders, many instruments, and many means uh, in Europe, and it's not always easy to understand who does what. But safeguarding fundamental rights is a common objective, and it is a common uh, goal, and this is why our um, um, at synergies uh, must uh, uh, be coordinated to ensure that there is complementarity amongst the different uh, means and uh, uh, key players, and complementarity is uh, fundamental. This is the uh, most important message that I would like to share with you today, because in protecting our common values in Europe, our institutions uh, at a supranational national level must speak with one voice, and God knows that this doesn't happen often enough.
But for this to occur, we need to ensure constant dialogue uh, at all levels. And this is why, once again, uh, I uh, warmly welcome this initiative that uh, makes for the opportunity to have uh, a fruitful exchange. I would like to dwell upon certain aspects of the role of the European Commission in this context. The uh, Commission works for the promotion uh, of uh, fundamental rights uh, using uh, its legislative uh, initiative powers in cooperation, of course, uh, with the um, Parliament. And there are a number of legislative initiatives uh, that we've seen recently that uh, strengthen the rights and principles of the Charter, such as uh, proposed directives on procedural uh, law in uh, criminal uh, context or the uh, important reform on data protection. And data protection was the focus of uh, uh, the remarks by our um, host, uh, and I will therefore uh, not dwell upon this. Secondly, as uh, guardian of the uh, treaties, the Commission uh, must ensure that uh, uh, the key documents uh, um, of the Union, including the Charter, are, are complied with, and this uh, uh, brings into play infringement procedures on the court under the oversight of the uh, Court of Justice. The Commission uh, completes this uh, uh, role, cooperating with the Court of Justice in enforcing the rights enshrined in the Charter. Thirdly, the Commission encourages the adoption of positive action to promote rights and progress in their achieve fulfilment, uh, and the approach uh, at a European level to fight against the exclusion of Roma is an excellent example of this. But it is important to continue to stimulate this politi political debate in order to attain the objectives of the the Charter. And I would like to welcome the uh, role played by the um, Fundamental Rights Agency. Finally, the role of the Commission is not uh, simply that of ensuring the protection of fundamental rights so, uh, in, in applying the um, the basic uh, law of the Union stricto sensu. The Commission has also undertaken to pursue um, its role as guardian of the values of the Union in adopting in its uh, 2014 communication um, a new EU, EU framework to strengthen uh, the rule of law. This is a concept which I know is going to um, have a significant repercussions in the coming months and years. And ensuring that the rule of law is respected is uh, an essential prerequisite requisites uh, for the protection of all other fundamental values listed under Article 2 of the Treaty. It is uh, um, a fundamental premise in order to guarantee the protection of democracy, human rights, and all the rights and obligations that uh, um, are based on the treaties, uh, on the Convention on, the, on Human Rights and International Law. And this is a guarantee that fundamental rights can truly be enjoyed. In other words, it is the guarantee of guarantees. We cannot live in uh, uh, the respect and promotion of fundamental li uh, rights, uh, banning all forms of discrimination and fighting against all forms of exclusion, if we do not ensure that our union and its member states uh, um, are based uh, on the on the principle of a union um, rooted in uh, rule of law. In its uh, March 2014 communication, the Commission describes its approach uh, um, in the face of uh, systematic threats to, towards uh, the rule of law in a member state. Its objective is to initiate political dialogue with a member state uh, based on a loyal cooperation with a view to seeking solutions uh, uh, before the, the situation worsens and before um, it is necessary to um, implement the mechanisms envisaged under Article 7 of the Treaty. The framework established in March 2014 is the missing link between, on the one hand, infringement procedures that can only be used if the um, law of the Union is violated, and on the other hand, mechanisms envisaged under Article 7, which are, are more of a canon, let's say. Um, these um, mechanisms envisage situations in which there's a clear risk of a serious violation or a persistent and serious violation of the common values of the Union and in extreme circumstances, and this is why I said it's the extreme solution, it's a canon, uh, uh, the, uh, the suspension of the rights uh, stemming from the treaties. This framework is based on the competences uh, that the treaty attributes to the Commission and the uh, possibility of investing the Council or the 
um, of the union uh, with a proposal based on Article 7. So with its communication, the Commission has uh, chosen to organize the exercise of its uh, power of initiative as envisaged by the treaty. This communication uh, en ensures that uh, um, the initiatives are fully um, predictable as is equal treatment for all member states and I would like to point out that this communication was not uh, um, issued taking into um, taking into account uh, one or another in a state. Uh, it is a case of addressing uh, all um, in, in, in the same way because we don't know uh, who, which of the member countries might uh, uh, require that these measures be implemented. Uh, so the approach of the Commission in protecting the values of the Union uh, undertakes to ensure that there are uh, synergies and complementarities stresses uh, to protect our essential values in Europe. Uh, complementarity and we have representatives of national parliaments with national mechanisms that already exist in existing member states but complementarity is also important when looking at what uh, the other uh, bodies can uh, uh, do in this area and obviously the council and the parliament will be regularly involved and informed on the, by the commission and this is logical because uh, they will have have to, if necessary, implement any proposal by the com uh, Commission based on Article 7 of the Treaty. This complementarity obviously um, exists uh, with uh, the Fundamental Rights Agency and uh, uh, the network of Supreme Courts. Last but not least, uh, as we say in French, uh, complementarity also exists uh, with the Council of Europe, which uh, plays an essential role in promoting democracy. Furthermore, the Commission can also uh, recur to the expertise of the Council of Europe and in particular that of the Venice uh, Commission. It will conduct its analysis in conjunction uh, with uh, the Council and the Commission and uh, um, obviously in all the cases where a matter is before these bodies. So it is only through complementarity and constant exchange and dialogue uh, amongst all of, of the national and European institutions that uh, we can ensure that uh, there is uh, a common uh, uh, culture in the field of rule of law in Europe. And unfortunately, the concept of rule of law, I, f um, I fear, is going to become increasingly important in coming years if we consider what is happening around the world. Uh, and therefore, I am um, uh, very happy to see that the Italian uh, uh, presidency intends to promote an exchange uh, and a focus on uh, the rule of law. And I'm also encouraged by the active par uh, participation of this parliament in this context. And to end uh, on an optimistic note, uh, I would like to point out uh, that uh, the rule of law and the Charter of Fundamental Rights are amongst the priorities of uh, uh, the new president, uh, um, Jean-Claude Duquet, who happens to uh, be um, like me, from a small country uh, for which uh, these principles are fundamental. The smaller one is, the more we need a rule of law which is guaranteed. And I would also like to remind you in this context that uh, the designated uh, Vice President Franz Timmermans uh, will for the first time uh, um, have uh, a mandate uh, for this particular uh, topic and this uh, testifies to the importance uh, that will be given to this topic by the new Commission. Uh, Madam uh, uh, President, thank you once again for having given me the opportunity to speak uh, and of course uh, I am uh, ready to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Many thanks uh, to Commissioner Reykjavik for her presentation and the um, support she's provided to the uh, presidency for having um, focused this uh, meeting on fundamental rights. I'd like to give the floor to Judith uh, Sunderland. Where is she? Yes. Thank you very much, Madam President. I will speak in English. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure for me to be here with you today. Um, I do work for Human Rights Watch, uh, an international human rights organization. So uh, I will speak bluntly um, about uh, our concerns about human rights violations within the EU. The EU is founded upon shared values, as we all know, and we have heard of human dignity, equality, and justice. But the reality is that for many here in Europe, it is a place of uh, exclusion, discrimination, and suffering. The EU has a very strong human rights framework. 
but respect for human rights is measured in deeds, not words. And serious abuses persist. Thank you. And uh, enforcement is lacking. Today, I will give you Human Rights Watch's assessment of the shortcomings in the EU's approach to human rights violations within its own borders and some commentary on recent developments that we've also just heard about, as well as offer some ideas for the way forward. But first, I want to focus your minds on, on what is at stake. It's, we're really talking about real people suffering real abuses and very real anguish. Arab and black youth who are stopped repeatedly for humiliating abusive identity checks by the police in France, obviously, uh, often rather, for no other reason than what they look like or where they live. Roma targeted for serial in evictions from informal settlements or segregated into formal official camps, as here in Italy. The poor and the homeless criminalized in Hungary. Other vulnerable groups like the elderly, the disabled, disproportionately affected by austerity measures. People evicted from their homes without proper safeguards or alternative housing. Migrants, asylum seekers, citizens and residents of immigrant origin attacked, beaten and killed because of who they are without appropriate or adequate investigations by the authorities. Undocumented migrants confined in substandard, sometimes downright appalling detention centers in countries like Greece for months on end. People fleeing war and persecution, including people from Syria and Eritrea, as President Boldrini mentioned, turned away at EU borders in Bulgari, uh, sorry, Bulgaria, Greece, and Spain. Women, men, and children dying in the Mediterranean in desperate attempts to reach what they believe will be a place of greater freedom, opportunity, and refuge. And I could go on. I do want to say that the fact that I mentioned certain countries is in no way intended to suggest that we believe those are the countries where the most human rights violations occur, and it certainly doesn't intend to mean that we believe other countries do not experience human rights violations. By the same token, the list of abuses is uh, unfortunately not at all exhaustive. But despite the existence of clear binding standards and laws relating to human rights and the competence and tools for addressing and remedying abuses, particularly since the Lisbon Treaty, EU institutions have largely failed to respond adequately to some of these and other pressing human rights abuses in member states. In the past two years, there has been increasing recognition of this failure and some efforts towards improving the EU's response. The Council of the European Union, which has traditionally shown the greatest reluctance to tackle rights abuses in member states, acknowledged for the first time in June 2013 that more needed to be done. And a working group within the Council on Fundamental Rights and Free Movement of pers Persons, called FREMP, has begun to slowly open up to consultations with civil society and expert human rights bodies like the Fundamental Human Rights Agency in a welcome effort that indicates a potential openness to broaden its scope, which has hitherto been focused um, quite a lot on the accession of the EU, the very important accession of the EU, to the European Convention on Human Rights. The European Commission announced in March of this year, uh, as we just heard in detail, the rule of law framework uh, to challenge member states over systemic threats to the rule of law. Uh, and of course, uh, as has also been mentioned, uh, uh, the creation of a new first vice president in the new commission with a portfolio that includes rule of law and the charter uh, of fundamental rights with the appointment of the very well-respected Dutch foreign minister, Franz Timmermans, uh, to the post is a very welcome sign of, of this growing momentum. I'd also like to just acknowledge uh, uh, the work of the European Parliament, its role, particularly the role of the Committee uh, on Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs. They continue to play a very important role in speaking out about rights abuses, uh, adopting and producing hard-hitting resolutions and reports that have not shied away from naming individual countries and specific problems. And the EU Fundamental Rights Agency, of course, produces valuable, uh, solid reports about violence against women and abuses against Roma, migrants, LGBT people, people with disabilities, and other vulnerable groups across the EU. So all this is very positive, of course, 
but ultimately of limited value if it doesn't translate into actual enforcement capable of remedying human rights violations, changing abusive laws and practices, and alleviating suffering. So the debate over the past two years, uh, which was arguably prompted by uh, uh, concerns over the situation in, in Hungary, has remained narrowly focused on extreme situations and has, yet led, has not yet led to concrete steps to address more chronic long-term problems. Um, I will not, uh, I'll skip over the part where I describe the new rule of law framework as the commissioner has just described it in detail. Um, we do see the rule of law framework as uh, a step in the right direction uh, to be welcomed. Uh, but as conceived, it really would only be applied to the most extreme acute situations and will not help to address chronic long-term problems. And for these, the Commission has long had the power to bring infringement proceedings against member states that breach EU law. It is our view and the view of many other uh, human rights organizations and civil society organizations that the Commission has been reluctant to use human rights as the basis for infringement. And its decision making and criteria have often been opaque and it has sometimes accepted cosmetic changes as sufficient to halt proceedings. As far as we know, it has never brought infringement proceedings, for example, against any country over collective expulsions, evictions, segregation in camps of Roma, despite ample evidence of systematic problems in several Western European countries. As far as we know, it has not brought infringement proceedings for pushbacks, for example, against Bulgaria, although it did send a pilot letter, which is a, a very first initial step. Uh, or from the Spanish enclaves of Ceuta and Melilla. We therefore welcome uh, the Commission's recent public announcement of infringement proceedings against the Czech Republic for discrimination against Roma in the state school system. And this action was based very clearly on Article 21 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, prohibiting discrimination on any grounds, including race and ethnicity, and on Articles 2 and 3 of the Race Equality Directive, which prohibits discrimination on those grounds in access to education. That decision to launch infringement proceedings comes seven years after a landmark uh, ruling by the European Court of Human Rights against the Czech Republic and DH and others in November 2007. And short of formal legal proceedings, uh, individual commissioners can and sometimes do speak out about particular rights situations in member states. This is a soft but powerful tool in our view for putting national authorities on, uh, on, on public notice. At the same time, the Commission's silence on pressing issues can send uh, the entirely wrong message. Uh, and in that context, it's worth noting, for example, that the Commission actually declined to comment when asked about the deeply worrying recent uh, pressure on uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations in Hungary. So we see that lack of political will, lack of transparency, and lack of a coordinated, coherent approach have hobbled the EU response to abuses within member states. And, but there are steps that we believe the EU can and should take to get on the right track. As Human Rights Watch and colleague organizations forming part of the Human Rights and Democracy Network have long called for, the EU should develop a comprehensive internal human rights strategy with a corresponding action plan to guide collective EU action. This strategy would bring together in one place all the existing tools ensuring better implementation of existing commitments. It would also provide EU institutions and member states clear guidance on how to respond to human, rights, uh, to, excuse me, to human rights challenges effectively and proactively. The EU adopted in 2012 a strategy and accompanying action plan for placing human rights at the heart of its foreign policy. Whatever the shortcomings in implementation of that strategy, it's pledged to promote human rights across all areas of the EU's external actions without exception, marked a very important recognition of human rights promotion as a core objective of the EU. We believe that the ambition for effective rights promotion and protection within the EU's borders should be no lower than for its foreign policy relations. 
Indeed, the action plan for the external relations strategy emphasizes that the EU and its member states are committed to be exemplary in ensuring respect for human rights within their own frontiers. And this reflects the acknowledgement that human rights, uh, human rights abuses at home undermine the EU's ability to be a, a, a credible force for positive change in human rights abroad, underscoring how the EU's internal and external human rights policies are interrelated and how a meaningful internal human rights policy, in addition, of course, to being important in and of itself, is key also for ensuring the EU's credibility uh, as a principal promoter of human rights in its foreign policy. I'm pleased to say that there, uh, that the idea of an internal human rights strategy has gained some momentum in recent months, and the Justice and Home Affairs Council in June of this year recognized the importance of uh, consistency and coherence between internal and external uh, work and endorsed the idea of an internal strategy on fundamental rights. The Commission, in consultation with the Council and the European Parliament, as well as the Fundamental Rights Agency and civil society organizations, should begin working on developing such a strategy. And we believe that specialized human rights committees in national parliaments can play an important role in encouraging their governments to support this stronger EU role and strategy and the adoption of such a strategy as a complement to their own efforts at the national level. In the meantime, EU institutions can and should take other steps to demonstrate a genuine commitment to addressing human rights abuses at home. In the Council, the FREMP working group should embrace an ambitious mandate to examine human rights abuses in member states and hold member states to account. It should intensify the initial steps it has taken to engage with expert human rights bodies and civil society organizations, as well as relevant parts of other EU institutions, such as the LIBE Committee in Parliament, in the European Parliament. And finally, it should intensify cooperation with COHOM, which is the Council's human rights working group focused on uh, external relations, um, which is actually required under the EU Human Rights Action Plan for external relations. The new commission should systematically open infringement proceedings against member states that violate EU human rights legislation, such as non-discrimination and directives relating to asylum sustain them until verifiable measures have been taken and be transparent and accountable for decisions throughout the process. The Commission should also use its soft power more consistently to put members on notice where serious concerns arise. The European Parliament should produce more courageous annual reports on fundamental rights in the EU with detailed information about rights concerns in specific member states and recommendations it should also ensure more systematic follow-up on important work it's done on rights abuses, such as the Tavares report on Hungary and the TDIP report on European complicity in CIA renditions and other abuses. The Commission, Council, and Parliament should agree to strengthen further the mandate of the Fundamental Rights Agency to give it the ability to look at all violations of human rights under all areas of EU law. And the agency, we believe, should increase and be, have the budget to increase its capacity to report on individual countries of concern, in addition to its very valuable comparative and quantitative work. This is a time of rising Euroscepticism, as, as we know from the recent European elections. The task for standing up for values and rights may not be easy, but we cannot be deterred. Showing that the EU is capable of protecting the rights of all those inside its borders, as well as those desperate to reach the EU in flight from war or persecution, is a way of rebuilding legitimacy for the European project and of honoring the values for which the EU stands. Thank you. Ringrazio. Many thanks to Judith uh, Sunderland for having um, presented this uh, very detailed uh, talk and for having highlighted uh, critical issues and also for the practical suggestions she gave um, from identifying a strategy for human rights and also measures which, in her opinion, would be useful to contain 
this uh, tendency from infringement procedures to soft powers to um, recommendations, all instruments which uh, are available but uh, which from her presentation would appear not to have uh, been used uh, sufficiently. And I'd like to give the floor to the director of the European Agency of Fundamental Rights, Morten Kero. I would like to ask him to uh, keep his presentation to around 10 minutes. I know you have a lot to say to us, but uh, we'd like to ask you to keep to around 10 minutes. You have the floor. Thank you very much, President Poldrini, Commissioner. Thank you very much, President Poldrini, Commissioner, ladies and gentlemen, members of Parliament. Uh, I really like, would like to thank the Italian Presidency of the European Union for this invitation and the very important initiative to bring this, uh, uh, all this group together. It is a very important and opportune moment to meet and discuss a common path to promote and protect fundamental rights in Europe in the EU. Soon, as we have heard, a new uh, European Commission with a very ambitious set of priorities uh, around growth, jobs, trust, as well as an underlying imperative to reconnect with citizens and member states, they will begin their work. And as has been said, let's not forget that actually the first vice president of this new commission will have in his job title the word fundamental rights. So fundamental rights has been lifted high hope on the new uh, commission's agenda. So this is an opportunity to reaffirm and strengthen our commitment to fundamental rights. And I would say if there's one message that you would like to take out, the message is that the EU institutions need the support and cooperation of national parliaments in protecting these fundamental rights. There is a need. These values, as we've heard, lie at the very heart of the European project. And fundamental rights matters to our citizens. That we see time and again in Eurobarometer surveys. Citizens say we are concerned and we expect that the European Union delivers on fundamental rights. And of course the experience of our citizens tell us that the job is unfinished. There is still a long way to go. The annual report of the Fundamental Rights Agency that we have brought, and it should be available uh, for all of you, shows how some of our fundamental rights values have come under strain during the current crisis and the number of the elements that Judith just mentioned. Of course, you will also see reflected in our annual report. But in a way, you can summarize it by that there is an increased lack of trust between people trust, lack of trust between communities, and lack of trust in our democratic institutions. All these trust levels have suffered in this particular period. And to the contrary, respecting, protecting, and fulfilling fundamental rights is one of the ways that we potentially can regain some of that trust at the national as well as at the EU level. The competence for implementing fundamental rights is shared between member states and the EU, but it is a common responsibility. Therefore, promoting and protecting fundamental rights has to be an area where EU institutions, governments, as well as national parliaments work together hand in hand to push it forward. I will illustrate the latter with two concrete examples which are highlighted in our annual report, as well as I will uh, elaborate a bit on some of the suggestions that we have also heard from other speakers here. But first, we should not forget to acknowledge that the EU has much to be proud of as well. Our citizens enjoy a degree of justice, freedom of security, which is envied by many people around the world in other regions. We have a legally binding fundamental rights charter. We have groundbreaking EU rules to protect people against discrimination, 
to allow citizens move freely uh, within the EU, as well as we have legislation safeguarding people's right to privacy. At the same time, we also do have tools to enforce this legislation. The tools are in place. But of course, as we have heard, we should not be complacent. There are areas of serious concern where our citizens require stronger protection of their rights so that the Charter become a reality for everyone. So let me start with the issue of data protection that we will also discuss later on the agenda. The revelations about mass electronic surveillance programs have undermined EU citizens' trust in the protection of their right to privacy, as well as a number of other rights following from this. They revealed weaknesses in democratic accountability and oversight, which is why the European Parliament is looking into this area as a matter of priority. And that this issue crosses borders, we need the European Parliament to work with you to regain the citizens' trust. One way to do this is to establish transparent, independent, and therefore credible mechanisms that protect citizens' rights and grant them access to remedies. We need more and more democratic oversight on the intelligence services as well as other entities that are there to protect personal data. This requires among work among national parliaments and between national parliaments and EU institutions and agencies. And I'm very pleased to note that, the next, that next spring an interparliamentary meeting on parliamentary oversight mechanisms and data protection is already in the European Parliament's cards. I've just been participating in a number of high-level EU meetings on redefining the EU's internal security strategy for the coming years. I think there is a growing recognition that we must include fundamental rights into the design of security measures to increase their proportionality and legitimacy. You could say that what we need is fundamental rights by design. It should be included from the outset. The Court of Justice, in its now, I think, famous uh, uh, decision on the annulment of the Data Retention Directive, has clearly underlined that we need fundamental rights by design. Surely we can only guarantee security to our citizens through transnational cooperation between police and judicial authorities. I think that goes without saying. There are worrying challenges in the field of security. We need collaboration. But at the same time, it's also true that we, for the protection of fundamental rights, it requires transnational cooperation as well. This is where citizens can benefit from the cooperation between EU, EU institutions, and the national parliaments in scrutinizing policies for fundamental rights compliance. So let me turn to the second issue that, again, others have also touched upon. It's on the rule of law. This is also an area in which we must work together to deliver on our shared responsibility for fundamental rights. Recent events in some member states raised the question of what to do in cases where EU basic principles and core values are severely challenged. The communication from the Commission from March this year on the rule of law has established a new framework to strengthen the EU's response to potential breaches of the rule of law, as has also been outlined by the Commissioner. This is a very positive step, positive step forward to address the systemic deficits in EU member states which impact adversely on the integrity of national institutions. What we are talking about is the weakening of institutions such as courts, 
ombuds institutions, data protection institutions, and others. These institutions which are put in place in order to, sec in order to secure the rule of law. From the work from the research and our large-scale surveys carried out by the Fundamental Rights Agency, here we have uncovered, you can say demasked, a certain sense of anxiety among people in living in the EU. And that's across our surveys regarding vic victims, that's ethnic minorities, persons belonging to sexual minorities, and most, vi most recently the survey we did on violence against women. Here we see that even when they are confronted with the most serious crime, they are not reporting to the police. Large numbers are not reporting to the police. And when we ask them in these face-to-face -face interviews they are, why they are not reporting to the police, what we hear from 60, 70, 80 percent of our respondents is lack of trust. Lack of trust that anything will be done. So we have a challenge, we have an issue where considerable groups in our society do not have sufficient trust in our institutions. So a fair judicial system, effective law enforcement, independent institutions, and not least a vibrant civil society are the basic elements for people to trust that they will be heard, listened to, treated fairly, protected and supported, and finally that they also will obtain justice. This trust is a precondition for so many actions. Citizens should be able to take this for granted across the EU member states. Just to take the European arrest warrant, if you cannot trust the judiciary in one member state, then the actual basis for the arrest warrant is largely undermined. Here again, your parliamentary committees play a vital role. You can review national laws and policies while looking at how the EU's core values are upheld in your country. And you are the filter which guarantees the EU directives are transposed in a fundamental rights compliant way. In this way, you crucially complement the work of the European Commission as guardians of the treaties. So, in winding up, what steps could be taken? As we have heard, the European Parliament, civil society, as well as the Fundamental Rights Agency in our uh, annual report, have suggested that the EU institutions could define an internal fundamental rights strategy to mirror the human rights framework and action plan that we have for the external policies. This could also, such a strategy could also include a fundamental rights policy cycle where rights are assessed annually by the EU and member states to evaluate, to assess the progress, to share promising practices on some of these areas which are deeply complicated and of course also to identify jointly future priorities. The national parliaments should be centrally involved in such a policy cycle. This would make sure that the experiences made by the national legislators feed into the policy making at the EU level. You could also cre consider creating a network of parliamentary committees competent for fundamental rights, meeting annually to compare experiences and learn from each other, just like you are doing, we are doing these days here in beautiful Rome. Along these lines, next year, the Fundamental Rights Agency will invite our newly appointed focal points in all the national parliaments. We suddenly realized that we as well in the Fundamental Rights Agency missed a more structured dialogue with the national parliaments and now each parliament have appointed a focal point uh, and we will invite them next year, early in February, I think, 
to come to Vienna and let's discuss how we can increase the interaction between what we do in Vienna at the EU level and what you do at the national level at the parliament, in the parliaments. After all, and here I will conclude, after all, I think we all should, of course, remember that the whole is always greater than the sum of the individual parts. And this applies equally to fundamental rights, where we have definitely have much more to gain from working together than working alone. And I think that is the whole essence of what Europe and the European Union is all about. So let's extend that more forcefully also to the fundamental rights area. Thank you very much for your attention. Many thanks to um, Director Moulton Kerum, who told us that uh, in the area of rights, the job is unfinished, which means that uh, we need parliaments who can uh, earn the confidence of their citizens. It is a required confidence in order to um, restore the central role of rights. It's true that often uh, abuses of rights are not even reported um, and I can um, feel I can confirm that also in view of my previous uh, experience at the UNHCR where in many cases refugees who came from afar reported that uh, along in their journeys and also once they'd arrived they'd been the victims of terrible abuse um, even when they were children and uh, I think that all this should uh, remind us of our responsibilities and uh, show us that it is essential to complete that task uh, as soon as possible. I hope that next time we can say the job is finished. But of course, we're not in a position to do that yet. So I'd like to thank all the speakers. And now we come to the discussion phase. And here I'd like to uh, give the floor to uh, Mr. Sisto who is uh, the chair of uh, the first committee, the Chamber of Deputies on um, Human Rights, Constitutional Affairs. Buonasera a tutti. Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to thank um, President Boldrini for having um, entrusted me with the chair of this very uh, important meeting with such authority. I would like to ask, uh, thank the uh, keynote speakers and um, all the speakers and director Kieran for his uh, extensive considerations. Before opening the discussion, there are some brief uh, comments. At the meal, aliquid vindico, as Cicero said, and uh, Latin culture at times uh, claims um, an autonomy of thought. In order to take up an issue which in uh, 2012 Vivian Redding addressed at uh, Tallinn at the FIDE conference, I think that the premise to deal with um, fundamental rights is to make uh, citizens the center of our policies. They are the engines of our democracies. We need to be credible. We need to regain confidence. This is what uh, Mr. Geron said, too, of all the citizens living in the European Union. And in order to do this, it is essential to um, take up the role of the um, Charter of uh, Fundamental Rights and to um, I'd like to record, remind you that the preamble of the Charter places the person at the center of the Union and uh, creating a space, an area of um, freedom, justice, and uh, security. And uh, I'd like to uh, stress the need for um, freedom in the working of fundamental rights within the European Union. And I think that it is important to stress that the constitutional nature of the European Union resides in the uh, importance which is ascribed to fundamental rights. And if this is true, in order to make 
the strategy for the full implementation of the Charter of Fundamental Rights uh, operational document of the 18th of October 2010, which has a checklist of fundamental rights. And it is clear that it is essential to um, make the issue of fundamental rights something which is uh, um, central work for Parliament. It's something which concerns constitutional systems and the legal systems in the Member States European Union. Our position uh, states that uh, the uh, doctrine in uh, Europe is the result not just of um, uh, treaties but also constitution traditions. The progress made in this field is very significant even though um, as yet uh, inadequate as uh, President Boldrini repeated the job is finished. The area of um, freedom, security and justice is probably the area where European legislation is uh, making most uh, rapid advances in some seeking, bringing um, substantial procedural law into line with these principles and also in uh, criminal law bringing uh, national legislations close together and obviously criminal justice must be uh, certainly administered in order to punish the guilty but uh, without making uh, the innocent uh, tremble. I think this is uh, something which is essential. The guarantee has to be for the non-guilty in uh, the just and fundamental attempt to punish those who have uh, infringed uh, laws and committed offences. So parliaments must have central roles in uh, the uh, development of uh, European regulation and cannot um, leave it to ex executive bodies, including the European Commission, definition of measures which to some extent have a significant impact on the uh, legal uh, sphere of citizens. And in this connection, I'd like to stress uh, in reference to what uh, Director Kerum said, the proposal he himself made to establish a kind of network of uh, European parliamentary committees who have responsibility for fundamental rights. It is a suggestion which leads me to make some comments. The first concerns the role which uh, uh, institutions and bodies such as the Agency for Fundamental Rights can have in supporting the role of parliaments in this delicate issue. It might be useful to agree here to that uh, uh, to establish a more continuing relationship between our parliaments and the agency so that we have an updated flow of uh, useful information, information which can allow us to deal effectively with delicate issues such as those connected with fundamental rights following this indication. So a kind of uh, ongoing joint uh, venture with um, a ongoing exchange uh, between our uh, organizations uh, as to um, is that to establish a network which can guarantee monitoring but also the creative supervision of what is happening and the developments in our countries. Therefore, I'd like to ask our colleagues and Director Kerem to well, give their opinion on the idea of the European Agency for uh, this network which could become uh, a reality. If this is the topic, I think that the um, wish of um, that this session can be a useful opportunity to exchange views in the a uh, common under, uh, understanding of the importance of fundamental rights is something which is um, important. I apologize for having spoken um, standing, but I'm a criminal lawyer. It's difficult for me to speak uh, while I'm sitting. And I also think uh, when you speak uh, standing, it gives more strength to your reasoning. And I hope that uh, this is a more elevated, if I can say that, use that term, to way to be begin the debate. So let's uh, begin the debate. Uh, we have seven uh, speakers on the list, and I'd like to give the floor to each of our colleagues for five minutes so that we can have uh, time for other uh, speakers, if there is time, and give the, enough time for the speakers to respond. It's a great um, pleasure to give the first speaker on the list, Hali Dukovic from Montenegro. The floor, you have the floor. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen and distinguished chair, uh, within this session I will speak on topic refugees and displaced people, inclusion of Roma and Egyptians in Montenegrin society. 
Uh, during the war in former Yugoslavia, a great number of refugees uh, stayed in Montenegro. Uh, in 2000 and in 1998, uh, that number was 140,000 of refugees, uh, primarily from Kosovo, which represented the quarter of the total population in that moment of Montenegro. Although military operations ceased, for the last 14 years, a large number of re refugees uh, remained in Montenegro. A uh, durable solution of problems and issues related to these persons uh, who are uh, Egyptians and dramas and in line with international standards uh, was a subject of a number of strategies who changed and complemented uh, as Montenegro uh, in 2006 uh, became an independent uh, country and she uh, and it has to change its legislation and the complexity of this problem exceeds capacities of existing institutions in Montenegro in their independent actions uh, that's why uh, inter uh, international organizations had to include uh, and especially countries of origin of these uh, refugees uh, the strategy was adopted in 2011, uh, and it uh, gave options to solve this problem. Uh, the strategy has defined two only possible solutions. Uh, the first was voluntary return to the country of origin, uh, which meant that, uh, that refugees could voluntarily uh, return to their country of origin and it has to be uh, based on the proper awareness about the situation in that country, in, in their country of origin. Uh, this process uh, shall take place with the help of the state of Montenegro, the international community and the country of origin, and no person may be deported. In, uh, deported. Another solution was uh, integration of all displaced persons who wish to remain in Montenegro and who choose not to return in their country of origin, and this will include acquiring a legal status of foreigner with permanent resistance or obtaining citizenship for those who are eligible or harmonizing national legislation in the way that refugees may have the same rights as Montenegrin citizens except the right to vote. Uh, then uh, education, of which are we especially proud, uh, because in some uh, towns we succeeded uh, to enroll in kindergartens and schools up to 90% of Roma children. Uh, then the right to employment, health care and social assistance. And I would like to emphasize uh, the right uh, to uh, resolving the housing issue of refugees, that is construction of housing uh, units. Uh, we are building uh, 907 uh, housing units and six pre 60 prefabricated houses and the government of Montenegro signed an agreement uh, with uh, Council of Europe Development Bank on constructing another uh, 120 uh, housing units. Uh, the great role in all this process uh, had the Parliament of Montenegro, uh, that is its Committee on Human Rights and uh, Freedoms. Uh, primarily, uh, we had a meeting with ACRI delegations uh, when we reinforced their recommendations, which have become binding for the government. Uh, then, as the Committee on Human Rights, we visited the refugee camp Konik 1 and 2, uh, and we meet with the living conditions of the refugees on the spot, as well as their needs and their desires for resolution of their status. Uh, a number of times we invited a Minister of Work uh, and Social Welfare on control hearing, in order to see how he fulfills his uh, tasks and many other activities, especially bearing in mind a vulnerability of Roma uh, population and fight with their uh, traditional beliefs, uh, which essentially uh, harms them more. Uh, those are uh, child begging, early uh, marriages, uh, uh, 
leaving of educational institutions and uh, the need uh, for registration, uh, which was a really a difficult job uh, to do because a number of Roma uh, women gave a birth outside uh, of the hospitals. I would like to emphasize that the problem of Roma is a problem of uh, many uh, countries, but in order to solve this problem, uh, we have to, uh, there must be political will, uh, good cooperation between all institutions, active participation of the international factors, as well as desire of the Roma population to be fully integrated. I believe that we in Montenegro are on good path to address this issue to everyone's satisfaction. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I entirely share the view that there is an asymmetry um, between the applicant uh, states and the member states as far as the human rights are concerned. On the one hand, the European Union is um, urging the applicant states um, to, to remedy the human rights violations. On the other hand, it fails to sanction its own uh, existing members uh, for, for violations. Now, the representative of Human Rights Watch um, made a very interesting statement. Uh, she spoke about uh, abuses within the EU. If she did speak abuses also in the applicant states, and when she mentioned my own country, she would have, uh, her speech would have been much, much longer, I'm afraid, uh, because of um, very serious human rights violations in Turkey. Now, it would be, um, of course, it would be desirable for the EU to pay more attention about abuses uh, in the existing member states, but it would have been equally desirable for the EU to adopt policies, more strict policies, to, uh, uh, to end, to terminate violations also in the candidate countries. I think the uh, EU should pay uh, more consideration and perhaps uh, think about more um, effective measures how to uh, bring human rights standards in the, candid in the candidate countries to the uh, international level, to the standards of, of, of uh, other European countries. Um, it is now accepted that uh, social rights are very important for fundamental rights, that these are in interdependent and indivisible. Um, so the, the, without so, so, social rights, the, the uh, individual rights would be uh, quite meaningless. And in this respect, social exclusion um, and poverty is certainly one big obstacle to enjoy uh, fundamental rights. Um, with poverty and social exclusion very much um, on the stage, the individuals are deprived of the right to have rights, as Hannah Arendt puts it. The individuals, um, they, they cease to, to, uh, have, uh, to, to be unable to exercise their fundamental rights and freedoms because of the state they find, because of social exclusion and poverty. But of course, poverty is not the only reason for social exclusion. Uh, the uh, political exclusion is also an equally important reason for, for uh, the deprivation of, of uh, fundamental rights. The link between social exclusion and, and, and political life is very much strong. Without political participation, uh, social exclusion cannot be prevented. Um, the political, uh, inclu political exclusion from the uh, exercise of political and economic power um, 
is also a reason for urban rioting and disaffection of young people. In my country, uh, one of the reasons of Gizi protests is, uh, the, uh, is this political uh, exclusion, uh, which led also to social exclusion. The, um, what, what is going on in Turkey, of course, is, is the, the ruling party, when you have a political engineering project for the country, all those who do not belong to the political engineering project are, are excluded uh, politically and as well as socially. And this has, this has led in Turkey to the Gezi protests. Um, well, so uh, all in all, I would like to thank you uh, for giving me the floor and I would uh, urge the uh, European Union also to pay more attention to the human rights situation in the candidate countries and uh, perhaps uh, find more innovative and uh, uh, more effective uh, measures in the dialogue in the uh, candidate countries to improve the human rights situation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Turman, and over to Furio Radin from the Croatian Parliament. Thank you. And I would like to go back to what uh, Ms. Baldrini said in uh, her address when she pointed out, in other words, that uh, fundamental rights uh, are to be upheld uh, in Europe, and this means uh, protecting minorities, and especially national and ethnic uh, minorities. These ought to be seen as uh, um, inalienable rights, uh, as was pointed out, and uh, uh, this is essential in order to um, overcome all forms of prejudice and bias. Uh, and uh, we know that um, at a time of crisis, uh, this becomes in all the more important. Uh, and uh, we know that when crisis worsens, these people are targeted. They uh, end up by uh, paying more than others uh, um, in the presence of uh, crises like the ones we're faced with. Let us not forget that Europe and the European Union is in particular, is the result of uh, a conflict uh, during which uh, um, sexual, uh, ethnic, uh, national minorities uh, were denied their rights. They were not even taken into consideration in order to guarantee the physical existence of people. I represent a country and I am chairperson of the uh, Human Rights Committee of our Parliament, uh, in which these things happened again. Let us not overlook the fact that armed conflict, unfortunately, has occurred again. We tend to think that what we've seen in the past, uh, the horrors of war will never uh, be repeated. Unfortunately, this was not the case. 20 years ago, once again, we faced a state of conflict uh, and uh, uh, minorities uh, uh, suffered. So I would like to hark back to what um, Mr. Sisto said i.e. that um, a lot has been achieved, uh, but much more remains to be done. Um, I agree. Unfortunately, though, I can't but uh, stress the fact that uh, um, much more must be done. We have made progress, uh, considerable uh, progress, especially uh, when it comes to legislative uh, frameworks and laws. But this notwithstanding, as we speak, We cannot deny that the rights of minorities are being in 
exploited, especially at a local level. We know that efforts are made at a national level, but then at a local level we witness various forms of degeneration, almost as if our countries were divided. Mm, let's say uh, in the eastern part, uh, for instance, of our country, uh, it is impossible to establish bilingualism for the Serb minority because of uh, local opposition. And then on the other hand, we have the West, where I come from. The national community, from, uh, the Dalmatian, Istrian, uh, Fiumen, um, is of Italian uh, um, language and their rights uh, go beyond the rights uh, enshrined in laws because we regulate these rights uh, on the basis of local uh, uh, statutes and charters. Obviously, we can't say that all is well and that uh, uh, we have achieved perfection, but there is a substantial difference between the two parts of my country, which, however, uh, makes for a negative atmosphere, especially on account of the discrimination which um, uh, occurs throughout the country. Um, and so, in conclusion, ethnic minorities in Croatia are still a political problem because there are various forms of discrimination. To this day, there are differences in the implementation of uh, um, relevant legislation on rights in the country. And this means that European um, institutions must uh, address this matter. But, and I turn to you, I think this is also something that the countries uh, of uh, uh, origin of these minorities, culturally speaking, should address this matter because, uh, um, as I said, unfortunately, this is still a political matter. Um, this is not just about bureaucracy. This is a political issue. And lastly, I think we should also establish a, a bilateral mechanism between the European Union and the various countries. Uh, and I like to stress this because minorities, ethnic minorities, but this is true of all minorities, especially so for ethnic minorities. Ethnic minorities obviously are different depending on the country we look at, uh, and there are considerable differences, so we mustn't forget our history. Thank you very much to our colleague uh, from the Croatian Parliament. Over to Baroness Joyce Quinn from the House of Lords of the United Kingdom. Thank you very much, Chairman. Can I say how much I welcome the initiative of our hosts here in, in Rome in organising this event on such important topics and welcome to the, the importance that the Italian Presidency is giving to these issues. Um, I'm a, a member of the European Committee in the House of Lords which looks at issues of uh, European Union justice and human rights provisions. Uh, and uh, we do feel, obviously, that it is important to enforce high standards in, in this uh, sphere, um, both because it's important in itself and also because of the example that it gives in terms of applicant countries. And it's interesting that applicant countries have already taken part in our discussions uh, this afternoon. Um, the committee that I'm on recently looked at the uh, proposals that the Commission had put forward about a, a new legal framework trying to provide for an, an early warning tool for systematic and persistent violations of human rights. Uh, and while we welcomed much that was in the document, uh, we did recognize, as I think the Commissioner herself uh, referred to, um, that there is perhaps a bit of a gap between the, the uh, soft power and talking to countries on the one hand and the use of the, the big weapon, I think she called it the cannon, of Article 7 on the other. 
and that perhaps we ought to look at ways um, ourselves of trying to fill that gap and have a, an effective process which does ensure that pressure is maintained on countries where there are specific violations of human rights. And perhaps in doing this, uh, two things are important. First, a very good flow of information between the European and national authorities. Uh, and uh, secondly, uh, a consultation to try and get maximum input from national parliaments into that process to try and get as effective a system as we can possibly implemented. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you very much to Baroness um, Quinn from the House of Lords. Over to Giovanni Paglia from the Italian Chamber of Deputies. Over to you. Grazie. Yes, thank you. Chair, I asked to take the floor because I wanted to take up the opportunity to um, exchange views with so many colleagues from uh, all over the European Union. Perhaps uh, my emphasis will be slightly different from others, but there are some uh, points I wanted to focus on in this um, venue. The impression I have is that the European Union in recent years has become increasingly capable of um, building cathedrals with words and uh, very refined uh, legal edifices. The problem for us who have um, political responsibilities is whether these refined um, legal and uh, political constructs actually have effectiveness. Because if we present rights and uh, we do not make it possible for our systems, uh, our citizens to claim these rights, I think we have a problem. And we do have a problem if a um, large percentage of our citizens have the feeling that when we speak of rights, our continent is moving backwards and not forwards. And I'm thinking in particularly of uh, those who live on the Mediterranean on this continent. And I think that when we speak of the Mediterranean, the problem of human rights is not just uh, for those who live on the European side, but uh, those who, because of the decisions taken on the European side, uh, come from the other side of the Mediterranean. Because I think that the first fundamental right, the first human right, which um, human beings has is that of being able to move. And uh, I think it's hard not to think of the tragedy which uh, occurs on a, a daily basis in the Mediterranean Sea and the deaths there um, for people coming because of our um, political decisions, namely to keep our frontiers closed and to deny a fundamental human right. If I think of political rights, I think of the fact that um, in, on this same continent, we have fueled continental powers, and I think we did well to establish continental powers, but uh, we've stopped thinking about uh, the uh, democracy, which has to be um, also uh, um, expanded and elevated. And I think this discussion, which is uh, lagging in uh, Europe, which is uh, um, focuses more and more powers in the European institutions and uh, makes, takes them further and further from European citizens. I think of the rights of equality, rights of citizenship in our country, in Italy, in the recent uh, uh, weeks we've been discussing the um, entry into uh, municipal registries of um, marriages contracted abroad, because in Italy this right does not exist. Um, uh, rights uh, do not um, exist. And uh, I think that if a European, if an Italian citizen wants to have the same kind of rights which apply to other European um, citizens, where, where should he go? I'm talking about gay m marriage, of course. What um, court can I address to, to um, have my own subjective uh, right, a right of freedom? applied. It's a right which is uh, in the Charter of Human Rights. It's in a number of constitutions in Europe. Where do I, who do I turn to to have these uh, rights uh, enforced? And all uh, constitutions which uh, were born 
after World War II in Italy, we say born from resistance, born from the battle against uh, Nazis and fascist um, regimes, which united Europeans, the right to education, right to freedom, right to movement. Where do all these rights end up when they are bombarded by austerity, austerity which seems to be the only uh, principle which remains? Uh, if in um, Italy and uh, Greece and in Spain people have the feeling that they had better medical treatment 20 years ago, really better, really better because there were better resources, and uh, they consider the, uh, they also consider that public services, transportation, etc., were better 20 years ago, and they think that there was a system which guaranteed the right to employment much better than it does today. When uh, we speak of rights, we members of parliament from the European Union, when we speak of rights in a common public uh, area, because we decided that there, will be a, that there should be a common public area, what do we say to our citizens from this point of view? Are we um, satisfied with taking one step forward year after year in terms of the writing down of these rights, or can we use venues like this, fora like this, to open a discussion on effectiveness, which means that a right is mine because I can claim it to be enforced and accorded. Thank you. Thank you to uh, Mr. Pandya. Now the floor to our colleague Ahmed Yemaya uh, from the Turkish Parliament. Divanı ve delegasyonu Türkiye adına selamlayarak kısa konuşmamı başlıyorum. I would like to start my short speech by welcoming all the participants and the member countries of EU. Dışlanmanın Sovyet uygulamasıyla acısını yaşamış bir dedenin torunuyum. Onun için onun kültürünü de onun hatıralarını da adeta gölgesinde soluyorum. I am a member of a family who has suffered the discrimination of the ex-Soviet regime uh, and now I still uh, be, feel the effects of that discrimination even though too many years have passed so far. Ben insanların insanı ve insanlığı keşfetme çabasını henüz tamamlamış olmadığını düşünüyorum. I believe the humankind could still not complete the process of inventing and discovering the real mean of humanity. Evet. Temel hak ve özgürlükler ve dışlanma birisi insana karşı dış ayraç, öbürü ise insanı ve insanlığı kuran temel değer. Fundamental rights have uh, established the ground for being the uh, real being and genuine human. But discriminating them uh, is a mean to exclude them from the rest of the society. Övünmeye ve övmeye değil, eleştirel bakışa daha fazla muhtaçız. We currently need do, do not need to praise the current policies, but we rather need to criticize and try to make them better. Evvela zihinlerimizi sorgulamalıyız. Ben zihinlerimizde insanlığın dışlanmayı henüz dışlayamadığını düşünüyorum. The first, the first thing we need to do is just to question the way of our thinking, and I believe, unfortunately, we are still not uh, come to, came to terms with discriminating the idea of discrimination. Gelişmiş ülkeler bakımından tüketim hırsı ve ihtirasıyla refah sarhoşluğunu sorgulamaya mecburuz. And uh, we we have no choice other than questioning. Uh, the logic behind the consumption and the uh, sense of discrimination that arises from the sense of corruption. Bilginin, bilginin derin bakışıyla korkunç bir fer, felsefe fukaralığını gözlüyorum. Uh, and I sense a lack of philosophy by the huge wave of information that indeed means nothing for practical reasons. Düşünüyorum ki bütün ülkeler, bütün milletler kendi tarihlerini düşmanlıktan arındırılmış olarak yeniden okumaya ve acıdan bal üretmeye daha fazla muhtaç olduklarını düşünüyorum. And I think all nations uh, should rediscover their histories through a look through a perspective of peace rather than hostility. Ortak büyüklerimizi ve ortak müktesebatımızı 
yeniden değerlenip değerlendirip etkileşim yoluyla daha fazla zenginleşmeliyiz. We need to enrich our vision through a common culture and a common past. Ben insan haklarına yönelik, insana yönelik saldırının nerede ve hangi nedenleri olursa olsun bütün insanlığın ortak refleks göstermesi gerektiğini ama bunun yakın zamanda gerçekleşemeyeceğini yakinen görüyorum. Whatever the reason, the all sort of violence could be encountered by a common reflex of the humankind, but I fear this will now this doesn't appear to be possible in the in the near term. Oturduğu mekan şahsen Avrupa Birliği'nin sosyal dışlanma örneğini canlı olarak ürettiği bir mekandır. The venue which I am staying right now uh, is the manifestation and indeed a sign of the culture of discrimination of the European Union. Şu anda Türkiye dinamik nüfusuyla, dinamik ekonomisiyle ve derin düşünce ve özgürlük felsefesiyle sanıyorum mekan itibariyle dışlanmayı dışlayarak Avrupa Birliği üyesi olması gerekirdi. And Turkey should have already been a member of European Union with its dynamic population, dynamic culture, and more importantly, the culture of harmony and uh, peace. Yüksek delegasyonu Mevlana'nın evrensel sevgisiyle ve selamıyla selamlıyorum. I would like to greet and salute all the members and participants with the uh, high moral of Mevlana Celaleddin Rumi. Thank you. All. Thank you. Grazie, la parola al collega Pignor. And now over to uh, Joseph Pignor from Poland. First of all, I would like to uh, stress the importance of the meeting of the chairpersons of the committees specialized in fundamental rights. I think it's a really important uh, Italian initiatives in this current European situation. We can say about this current European situation as a kind of a paradox. Uh, paradox of uh, European situation. On one hand, EU has a very strong political identity, and this political identity is about peace, democracy, uh, human rights, and the rule of law. And it works. It works particularly in the external world as uh, uh, we have seen in Eastern Europe, in Ukraine, where EU became a symbol of uh, democracy, human rights, simply a symbol of a better, better life and better world. But at the same time, we have the reality in, uh, uh, within the EU countries, which was described today by the European Watch Report and uh, European EU Fundamental Rights Report. And this reality is uh, quite often very sad. The social and political exclusion, the situation of the Roma people, the situation of immigrants, very often the people without rights, even without dignity of the human presence, human trafficking, violations against women and violations against even a habeas corpus, as in the situation CIA rendition on European soil, or violations against uh, privacy, which uh, the picture of these violations became very clear after the Snowden leaks two years ago. What is to be done in this situation, I think what is really on the agenda is a, a kind of a new cooperation between EU institutions and state parliament of the EU. A new cooperation in formation of a kind, a kind of effective, let's say, new fundamental rights architecture in this new global situation in our uh, contemporary world. I hope that the Italian presidency, uh, the time of the Italian presidency uh, will help to uh, formation 
of this uh, new goal and will be a little closer on this way uh, in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you. And now over to Burhan Kutsu from the Turkish uh, Parliament. Hürmetli muhabbete selamlıyorum. I would like to greet all the members and the participants with due respect. Sayın İmaya'nın temennilerine yürekten katılıyorum. And I wholeheartedly agree with the points made by my colleague Mr. İmaya. Sosyal dışlanma çağımızın çok ilerilemiş ciddi bir hastalığıdır. Social discrimination is a chronic disease of our ages, unfortunately. Evvela tanımı konusunda birçok yaklaşımlar yapılmış ama en kestirmeden şu söylenebilir. There are too many ways to define it, but I think it could be defined as follows in brief. Kişinin toplumla olan bağlarının kopması sivil, siyasal ve ekonomik ve sosyal yurttaşlık haklarından yoksun olması denebilir. To cut the ties of an individual with the rest of the society and making him deprived of his fundamental rights including social, political and economic. Bu konuda Avrupa Sosyal Şartı ve bu bağlamda ilgili 30. maddesi çözüm olarak gösterilmekte ve bu maddede yapılan değişiklik bence doğru olmuştur. The amendment proposed in the relevant article of the European Social Charter is a welcome development and I we approve it in this regard. Dışlanma konusu sadece yoksullukla çözülemez. Ayrı bir hak olarak ele alınmalıydı. Nitekim buna yaklaşılmış. Social exclusion cannot be attributed to poverty solely to poverty. Uh, and I uh, observe that the current amendment has enlarged it and this appears to be a very appropriate decision. 2011 verilerine göre sosyal dışlanma risk altında Avrupa'daki rakam olarak 120 milyon kişinin risk altında olduğu raporda yer almaktadır. According to the report uh, more than 100 and uh, more, more than 120 million our people are now facing uh, the risk of social exclusion. Social Hakları Komitesi'nin raporları ve toplu şikayet üzerine karara bağladığı bir takım özel durumlara baktığımız zaman şunu görüyoruz. Uh, uh, when, observing the, when observing some uh, circumstances uh, proposed by the Social Rights Committee, we can see that. Özellikle romanlara yapılan kimi muameller bunların seçimde haklarının verilmemesi, konut meselesi ve e, gettol oluşturmaları konusu komitenin önüne gelmiş. The committee has uh, uh, assessed the practices against Roman population including their right to vote, right to, right to have housing and building their own gettos. Konu olan şikayetler üzerine Hakların bütünlüğü ilkesini vurgulamıştır çok isabetli bir şekilde ve bu bağlamda da ilgili ülkeleri suçlu bulmuştur. Uh, and evaluating the complaints by, by the Roman population, it, the committee has ruled that the, all these rights are indivisible and uh, has, uh, has convicted the uh, complaint countries. Ayrıca Avrupa Sosyal Fonu bu konuda önemli bir e, imkan sağlamaktadır. And European Social Fund e, provides a unique opportunity in this manner. Ancak ırkçılık eğilimleri genelde dünyanın birçok yerinde olan ırkçılık eğilimleri kaygılandırmaktadır. Uh, but this the tendency to go to racism also concerns us. Bu bağlamda 22-25 Mayıs 2014 tarihinde yapılan Avrupa Parlamento seçimli sonuçları endişe vericidir. The results of the European Parliament elections which were held on May 22nd and 25th is a great source of concerns for concern for us. Biz Türkiye olarak Avrupa Konseyi üyesi olmamız, kurucu üyesi olmamız, Avrupa Birliği sürecinde aday ülke olmamız nedeniyle 
tüm bu gelişmeler yakından takip ediyoruz. Since we are the we were we are one of the founding members of the Council of Europe and the candidate country of the European Union, we have to, we we are closely following these level developments. Özellikle 2010 tarihli anayasa değişikliği ile çocuklar, yaşlılar, engelliler vesaire gibi bir takım kesimler hakkında pozitif ayrımcılık getirilmiştir. Following the 2010 referendum of our constitution, some positive discriminations for children, elderly and disabled people have been initiated. Vakıflar yasası ile de dini azınlıkların bir takım kadre uğramış hakları da geri verilmiştir. And with the law of foundations enacted by the parliament, some some rights of the religious minorities that have been pushed backwards have now been improved. Evet, söyleyeceklerim buna ilgili. Çok teşekkür ederim. Thank you so, thank you very much. Grazie. La parola. Thank you. Yanis Koskinen from the Finnish Parliament has the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of the Finnish Parliament, I also want to thank the Italian hosts for organizing this uh, meeting and this atmosphere. Uh, I noticed that uh, in the inter introduction, introductionary speeches, the interchange between the national and European parliamentary committees on constitutional affairs and human rights was mentioned in all of the opening and, and keynote introductions. I want to stress the importance of this development and, and this kind of cooperation. We have to create new working methods uh, to have positive and constructive impact on the European development of, of basic rights and, and uh, r the rule of law. But in this, uh, I guess I, we should prepare our agenda and have a uh, steady follow-up of what the European Parliament is doing, what our institutions are doing, and to have a, also maybe written remarks by the national committees, and not only these uh, more or less sporadic uh, uh, meetings of, of the European Committee and, and the national constitutional committees. I uh, welcome the idea which was uh, told by FRA Director Morten Kerman about uh, meeting of these uh, different parliament focal points, the cooperation partners of, of human rights institutions and uh, that it would occur in Vienna next February. Uh, I would also like to thank about this uh, annual report, the, the, especially the annex about the international human rights instruments. It, is, it makes it easier to get the total picture on what is happening in this field of, of uh, human rights, both in Europe and, and globally. And it also connects our work in the parliaments with the other governmental and NGO activities in, in all our, our countries. There are major differences in the supervision and protection mechanisms of constitutionality and basic rights in different EU and applicant countries, as we know. There are also huge differences how well and carefully uh, these uh, basic rights are implemented in the administration and, and court system of different countries. Uh, we have uh, constitutional and federal courts of justice in, in certain countries. Then we have varied constitutional interpretation powers of the judiciary, especially the supreme courts of our countries and the European uh, courts. Uh, especially in the field of social exclusion, these differences are very huge. Uh, what kind of powers uh, the 
specialized constitutional committees of the parliament have to investigate the different bills of the uh, government, how well they protect the social rights of, of citizens, and also how well, what kind of possibilities the citizens have to get their rights through the judiciary, uh, the specialized or, or supreme courts of, of their own country. And this is what we have to follow, more closely follow in our reports, uh, by also by the FRA in the future. And uh, this kind of uh, feedback from our parents uh, and the more independent supervision bodies is of utmost importance. Uh, construction of national human rights institutions has taken various paths uh, in our, uh, according to our national traditions and developments in, in different EU countries. Uh, there is an important uh, fact that uh, we have tried have to try avoid. Uh, uh, two rail systems that uh, those uh, national human rights institutions and the supervision, the official supervision systems of, of human rights don't take uh, very differing paths, but you have to find a common route to develop our basic rights in the same direction. And uh, this is also one of the reasons why this uh, cooperation between uh, the independent human rights supervision bodies and, and the parliamentary ones and the governmental ones are very important. Thank you. Grazie, anche per il rispetto del... Thank you. And uh, now over to our colleague uh, Joseph uh, Miklovsko from uh, the National Parliament of Slovakia. Um, we are from Slovakia. We are 10 years in Europe like other 10 our colleagues, countries. We are proved for it. Mostly 70% of our inhabitants in persuaded that it is positive for us. Europe is not a problem, but it is solution of the problems, especially today's crisis, which can be also a new chance for us but without changing of today's war financial systems, without changing of so-called casino economics, without pumping of money to failing banks, we cannot solve this crisis which is today still here. I want to underline the competence of European Union against the competence of national states in such a topics like culture, education, family, social affairs. On the national level, therefore, we should not always accept resolution for the European Parliament, for example, especially in our country, was very much negative discussed, such a report like Estera report or Lunacek report, which seems to be um, against a competition of national states. Uh, 27 countries has 27 laws about family, and also in Slovakia we have one. Uh, moreover, two months ago in Slovak National Parliament we, add, we add, added to the, our constitution new paragraph that family and marriage is unique relation between men and women, and Therefore, state must prevent and support marriages, family, and children. In this sense, this is a very sensitive topic in Slovakia. We have about half a million now inhabitants which require referendum on these topics. And now four questions are approved by constitutional court. In Slovakia, it was very popular so-called March for the Life last year, in September in Korsia, which was about fast 100,000 people there, and we prepared such a, the, stay, uh, the same march also in next year. 
In Slovakia, we have some special condition. About 80% are Christian, believe, believer. We have about 25 older people with average pension about 400 euro is not too much. And uh, the number of children, like in other countries, are decreasing. And therefore, if we really do not support our classical family, also Slovakia will be in some years removed from the map of Europe. We have also ethnic minorities. For example, in Hungary, we have about 10%. We have Roma, gypsies, about 7% in our country. In this sense, we are number one as an, for the number of inhabitants in Europe. We have also about 5% of dis disabilities people in my country. And we, we should continue with uh, such a, uh, various minorities, which could report of some problem. Uh, but I, I want to underline such a, a contradiction, which is in our thesis in this section, which is named New Tools of Combat Discrimination. Discrimination, uh, something like that, yes. It is spoken uh, three times on the various level of importance discrimination in Europe. For example, on the ground of religion or belief, based on age, the old, elderly, ethnic minorities, for example, Roma, people with disabilities, and so on and so on. But three times it is underlined also the topic of sexual er er orientation, topic of LGBT, family, gender, and so on. I, I think that uh, in Slovakia, especially this last class of people, have really necessary rights, and uh, therefore we have no discrimination of these one, two percent of our citizens, and therefore, of course, there is some priority, elderly people, family, ethnic minorities, and so on, and uh, uh, here in our document, our discussion, all these uh, problems are on the same level. It seems to me is not the case. Thank you. Thank you to Mr. McCluska. And now over to the last speaker, Senator Chiro Falanga. Vice Chairman of the um, Senate's uh, Human Rights Committee. Thank you, Chairman. And I would like to welcome all of our colleagues. Um, Baroness, um, sorry, Miss Sunderland has made a very good point, i.e. that um, international credibility can be expected only provided that certain laws and rights are, are um, guaranteed at a domestic level, at an international level, if these rights are not, say, protected adequately, it is hard to imagine that uh, one will have the international credibility to demand that others respect certain rights. And this applies not just to the European Union as a whole, but to individual member countries. What I'm trying to say is that each member state must be guided by this general principle, as was quite rightly pointed out uh, by Judith uh, Sunderland. Article 80 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union states the principles of solidarity and equal sharing of responsibilities. Now, 
stating a principle is certainly to be considered as a, a powerful message from a country or a community. But if implementation doesn't follow, if this is just a signal and there is no concrete practical implementation of the principle that is stated, uh, sadly, this means that nothing comes of this. It is only uh, a statement of intent uh, with no concrete implications. And this is even worse than not stating anything of this kind altogether. Over the last few years, the political and social crises of um, countries uh, um, in the neighboring uh, region of the European Union, I'm referring to Syria and Libya, have triggered a flow of migrants of, of a truly extraordinary nature. We're talking about millions and millions of citizens who leave their countries and hope to be able to find a place where they can be respected as human beings and that is why they attempt to reach Europe. Referring back to Article 40 of the treaty which uh, states uh, the principle of solidarity amongst uh, um, countries, I think that uh, when it comes to managing these flows of migrants, uh, one should be inspired by this particular principle of solidarity. Our country is on the border of Europe. Our people, and the people of Sicily in particular, when it comes to human solidarity, have uh, welcomed hundreds thousands of migrants, especially on the island of Lampedusa, um, people who attempt a, a perilous crossing um, in makeshift vessels. And they have done this on the basis of uh, uh, the principle of solidarity that is part of our Italian culture. But this flow needs to be governed uh, together with all other um, EU countries, and I am obviously not referring to, I'm not referring to the need to share the financial burden when I talk about shared responsibilities. It's not just about financial resources. However, International bodies must uh, uh, play a role in uh, managing uh, this uh, issue, this phenomenon. These flows, as we know, uh, come with no warning. Suddenly, there are thousands of people who reach these tiny towns in southern Italy, in Sicily, or in Calabria. And this is why we need an external signal showing that Europe really does apply the principle of solidarity. And this is the emergency that uh, we're faced with. And obviously, any human rights violation even examples of violations uh, that we've seen in the past uh, obviously require that there be a common uh, EU policy, but now we're faced with an emergency. And this is a contingent situation which requires that all members of our family, all members of the European community must firmly stand steadfastly 
to uphold the principle of uh, the respect uh, uh, for human rights uh, and human beings. Thank you very much, Senator Falanga, before handing over to our uh, keynote speakers um, for their answers. Um, just some practical considerations. Uh, I didn't think there was any point in uh, uh, commenting these um, uh, various contributions. Uh, I did not want to filter uh, any of the uh, say, contributions to this debate. Um, so the speakers will obviously take the floor to respond to these various questions. But if I may, I would like to stress that there are some key words that uh, are, are important. Coordination, information, consultation, and above all, effectiveness of principles. Principles are all very well, but it is not enough for them to be just stated, they must be implemented both in the member states, in the safeguarding of uh, ethnic minorities, but uh, especially as our uh, Turkish colleague said, in candidate countries too. So the question is whether it is at all possible to guarantee that the uh, principles of fundamental rights can be safeguarded uh, in candidate countries as well. So I think that, as is true of uh, Platonic philosophy, we should consider the proposal made, i.e. that of a uh, human rights body, an organization that uh, could act uh, as, uh, um, let's say, uh, a guarantor as a guardian of these rights. Uh, um, and we shouldn't forget that solidarity is also to be seen in terms of uh, a geographical burden sharing. There are some countries that are more exposed to certain uh, human rights related issues. This is true of migration. So these are not problems that uh, can only be tackled at an individual state level. These are European um, matters. And I would like to reassure our Turkish colleagues um, I know that this is something that was mentioned. This is not a meeting that uh, uh, has in any way discriminated against any member country or candidate country. Everyone is free to express uh, um, his or her views. And I think the very lively debate we've had is tangible proof of this freedom of expression that we've guaranteed to all. And now I'd like to hand back to the speakers. Uh, hopefully they will be able to give practical indications and answers. I think that would be the best thing because rather than just uh, expressing our views and feelings about things, we, we could really be very concrete in our um, deliverables. Over to Commissioner Reckitz. Thank you. First of all, um, many thanks for all these uh, statements. Um, and uh, I would like to uh, restrict myself to two or three comments. So, so much was said that I think it's impossible to answer everything globally on the issue of fundamental rights and the rule of law, the uh, discussion which has been held since the Commission uh, made its statement shows that sometimes it's very difficult to return to a legal framework and to understand it uh, and to, to respect it completely. And I understand the frustration of those who want to go a long, long, long way further ahead. But uh, we have done uh, quite a lot. We have an Article 2 and Article 7, and I think that we have an obligation to work within the framework of the Treaty and the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And when I see that uh, the uh, discussion um, which has led to certain uh, places in the council or in member states um, has been discussed and uh, the pros and cons have been explored and sometimes the best is the enemy of the good. And I think that we really need to be able to move forward along this line and see what comes out of the uh, Council of General Affairs debate under the Italian presidency in November to see whether we can move the discussion forward because uh, certainly it is a debate which uh, deserves to move forward. Um, it was the Co Court of Justice which introduced fundamental rights in the legal order of the European Union, and it's something which happened 30 years ago. 
And so these are values which are recognized by the court. And it's interesting to see that the court, including uh, the um, decision on retained data, has uh, given precedence to individual rights above uh, economic rights. So I think sometimes we need to uh, be very clear about uh, this kind of thing. One word about the recognition of um, public documents concerning um, uh, civil status. And um, I understand uh, the complaints of those who um, are talking about the lack of efficacy in Europe. And there's something which made me smile when I took up this portfolio um, a long time ago, quite, quite a long time ago, uh, I studied this um, area and I saw how much progress had been made in this uh, area. When I w- worked in Jacques Santer's office, who uh, invented the concept of the third pillar, I would never have thought that today there could have been such a um, rich discussion uh, of the kind which we um, had. So I think we certainly say we need to do more and we need to do better. But uh, I think it's uh, interesting sometimes also to recognize that we made huge uh, progress in civil law in the recognition of um, sentences and decisions. Uh, Huge progress has been made. Certainly a lot still has to be made. But I think we also need to thank those who've worked so hard to make certain things possible. And finally, on criminal law, at the uh, Council. Uh, We're going to have a meeting among uh, ministers of justice, and we're going to speak of uh, seizures and uh, impounding of assets. And if someone had told me 30 years ago, when I was a student, that one day uh, we'd have a asset seizure uh, system without there being a criminal procedure, I would have laughed. I wouldn't have taken that seriously. Today, this is a discussion which is taking place in Italy and elsewhere, and I think that we are devising uh, legal systems which are different and which are difficult, because there again, we find ourselves at the crossroads um, between what individual freedom is and the requirements of protection of society and uh, retention of data is one example of this. Another thing is... uh, the public security and individual freedom and uh, seizing of assets, seizure of assets is another area where it's very, very difficult to get the right balance. I think that we're an area where we need your support and we need your intellectual input so that we politicians can find this balance between the requirements of security and the requirements of um, human rights and rule of law. And I think there's a um, debate here which is legal, but it's also sociological and philosophical. And I really thank you um, warmly for all your input. Uh, Perhaps just one word to our Turkish colleague. I think it was uh, Montenegro initially. I hope I'm not mistaken. We noted that the ambassador of Turkey expressed uh, interest not um, long ago in um, having observer status at the Agency for Fundamental Rights, and a similar request was made in the, in the Balkan by the Balkan countries. Um, I can say that we support this. Uh, request, and I think that we're moving uh, towards um, a stage which could um, lead to very positive developments. It's something which we um, are very much in favor of. Thank you, Chair. Grazie. La parola alla... Thank you, uh, Judith Sunderland, for her response. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as I said, I, am, I consider myself a human rights activist. I work for a, a leading international human rights organization. So I see my role, we see our role uh, uh, as one to document and to denounce, to expose. Uh, we will always want to uh, uh, speak for those who cannot describe their own pain and the abuses they've, they've suffered, and we will always try to, to seek for change. Um, And in a a sense, we will never be completely satisfied. Uh, We will always have something to complain about, uh, unfortunately. Um, But I do do fully respect the the Commissioner's comments, and and we do do applaud uh, the many achievements of the European Union and of of, uh, single member states 
in, uh, uh, in uh, respecting and promoting human rights. And it is important to, to always repeat that. And it is, in fact, as, um, as was said before, uh, the fact that the EU does have an enviable uh, human rights framework that so many people around the world look to the EU as an example. Um, and this is to go to the, to the point of um, Senator Falanda that uh, it, it is incredibly uh, crucial for the EU to uphold human rights uh, principles at home in terms of their credibility abroad. Uh, my colleagues working around the world regularly in meetings uh, when they are pressing uh, uh, government officials to respond to our recommendations to our to what we've exposed in terms of abuses and along with other organizations obviously uh, will point to abuses uh, of human rights in the United States and in the European Union uh, and say why aren't you doing anything about those um, uh, and we see more and more uh, countries around the world looking at what's happened this year in the Mediterranean um, uh, uh, with all of the, uh, with the increasing boat migration and with uh, a horrifying death toll of over 3,000 people, uh, and they're wondering what what is the e what should the EU be doing more uh, to ensure that those people um, have a have a safe harbor. And on that note, I, I would just commend. Uh, remark, uh, remind us all that uh, when we're talking about people fleeing the war in Syria, uh, Turkey is hosting, uh, I think, two million um, uh, people uh, displaced by the conflict, um, whereas uh, the numbers are far, far lower in, uh, in the European Union. And in fact, the, the offers for resettling particularly vulnerable refugees and asylum seekers uh, are, are very low, uh, unfortunately. So when we talk about solidarity, it's, uh, it's solidarity amongst uh, the member states. It's, it's, it's human solidarity, as you said, Senator, uh, uh, solidarity towards those who are, uh, who are in such, such need. Um, I just would conclude to say thank you very much for this very interesting conversation. I thought it was interesting that um, in the different interventions uh, there was attention to uh, particular human rights issues in particular countries and, and some uh, proud, rightly proud uh, acknowledgement of progress in, in certain countries. Uh, and, and I think it's always very useful to have this kind of exchange. Um, so thank you very much. Grazie alla Judith Sunderland. Thank you, Judith Sunderland. And I'd like to give the floor to Martin Kerr, who um, will obviously um, be able to assess how far his uh, proposal has been taken up by our participants and how uh, he, if possible, it is. Thank you very much. And uh, just to uh, start on, on the last issue that was raised by Senator Falanga and that you also responded to. Uh, on uh, the migration or the terrible situation on, at the uh, southern sea borders. Uh, I look very much forward to a, a joint uh, conference together with the uh, Italian presidency just a month's time from now here in Rome on exactly uh, that issue where we try to bring together uh, all the key actors in this field from uh, member states, EU institutions, civil society, etc., to see how, I mean, where, where can we move this discussion? Can we find, try to take at least some next steps uh, in, in finding, I don't believe in solutions, but then at least some progress uh, in uh, addressing the particular tragic situation that we have in the Mediterranean? I look very much forward uh, to that, and I would thank the Italian presidency for excellent collaboration on, on this issue. Then let me come back and, uh, and also echo uh, what the Commissioner said in relation to candidate countries and their uh, participation as observers in the management board of the Fundamental Rights Agency. We look very much forward and very hopeful now that uh, some of the candidate countries can uh, become observers. Uh, so far, the only uh, country which uh, for one year had an observer status was Croatia, uh, and I think uh, both the agency and hopefully also the Croatia benefited a lot from uh, that particular uh, uh, status uh, with the agency. Because what is it, and that would then also be, again, coming back also to what uh, our Croatian colleague uh, raised, uh, where he 
uh, rightly said, one thing are all the laws and institutions that we create, uh, but how does it actually work? And that is a unique feature of the Fundamental Rights Agency that we can also bring to candidate countries, is that we do not satisfy ourselves by looking at whether the one or the other law has actually been uh, created, has been adopted in, in member states. We also look to, does it work? Does it actually meet those concerns that eventually led to, to the uh, creation, the adoption of the legislation, whether it's anti-discrimination, data protection, or whatever the issues may be? And how do we find out? What do we do? And this is where we do these very big surveys where we ask in particular minorities in our uh, communities. Normally when, when we previously uh, made minority or looked at how minorities so to say, live in our societies, we normally ask the majority, what do you think about the minority? How do you like to have a, a, a lesbian or a gay person as a neighbor or a, an immigrant as president or, or whatever the issues may be? What we do is that we actually ask the, the migrants, the sexual minorities, and uh, most recently we interviewed 42,000 women about their experience, about violence, face-to-face, one-to-two-hour interviews about the experience. And it's the same with, with the, the ethnic minorities and others. And that gives us a tremendous insight into what the situation, the level of discrimination, how people are being received by the authorities, etc., etc., which actually offers you a, a lot of possibilities to act because it's broken down. Do you feel that you have ac access to the health sector? We have asked Roma population, ethnic minorities and others. And when you suddenly can see, no, they actually feel discriminated. They feel that there are barriers for them to access the health system. Then we have a problem. And it's a problem you as politicians can address with the institutions in member states, the health ministry uh, and others where the particular concerns are. And that is what so to say, the agency and the union is bringing now to the fundamental rights arena is that renewed level of specificity where we actually can start really taking uh, mainstreaming or real implementation of human rights much more serious uh, than we could before, simply because we didn't have data on these issues uh, before. And as I touched upon in my opening remarks, we have, the agency has unmasked an, a disproportionately high level of hate crime in Europe, an issue that we have sort of partly dealt with but not really because what we saw was that it was not really a problem when we looked at the official data, what is being reported to the police. But now when we ask the minorities, we can see there is a problem here and they do not report to the police because there are certain uh, concerns. So I think this is just to understand also what, what is it that we can bring in, but also to understand the uniqueness of Europe because there are no other regions in the world which actually have this sort of, of data. We are often being contacted from other regions say, hmm, this looks really interesting to get that sort of data because it brings the fundamental rights work to a, a new level. Let me just bring one other issue, and that is to what uh, our Finnish colleague, Mr. Koskinen, uh, raised on the institutional landscape, uh, the different actors. Because I think there's a lot in the making at the moment uh, in Europe, which is very interesting, both at the, the uh, national level a coming together of the national bodies, meaning here the national human rights institutions that you mentioned, the equality bodies, the data protection institutions, and other what we collectively call the national human rights bodies. And it's high time because I said, do the, does the legislation work? Another question that we ask is, do the institutions work? the institutions that we have established. And here again, I must say that from our work, we can time and again see that some of these institutions are simply not reaching out to the most vulnerable, those who are most in need of these institutions. So you could say we have now, thanks to the EU legislation, the, uh, the directives against discrimination, we have uh, established, for example, equality bodies in all member states. But at the same time, we can see that in an, quite a few member states, they are very unknown to those most in need. So this is where we now should take the next step and actually say, okay, how can we create a stronger fundamental rights landscape 
uh, st stronger fundamental rights protection at the national level, because it is first and foremost at the national level that fundamental rights should be protected. They should be protected as close to home as at all possible, and not by faraway institutions in Brussels or Strasbourg or in the, in the UN. They are sort of say secondary to support what is happening at the national level. And this is where we can do still a lot at the national level. But, so that's the horizontal. And of course there's then the vertical, the interaction between the national level institutions and the EU institutions, which are also uh, in the making. All that is coming more and more together. There's a, a lot of activity, I would say, at the European level. Uh, and, uh, and I look very much forward to see where that is taken in, in the coming years. I think we'll see a much more coherent uh, landscape. You could almost say that the landscape moves and transforms into an, an architecture uh, in Europe, a better thought out system where the different actors more clearly know who is doing what, why, and when. And this is very much needed. And a lot of the problems that we have discussed, that we see in our annual report, that Judith raised and others have raised, I mean, they can also be addressed more firmly by simply tightening uh, those institutions already in place. So thank you very much. A very uh, inspiring uh, comments, uh, questions, and I look very much forward to the continued uh, dialogue and also to follow up uh, with the, the initiative, as I said, uh, inviting the uh, national rapporteurs from the parliament to uh, the agency in, in February. Thank you very much. Thank you to Martin Kerl. I um, think I could point out that the basic uh, issue which emerges from this debate is how much the internal guarantee of fundamental rights can uh, influence the external guarantee on the part of the European Union and vice versa. How much uh, Europe's intervention can contribute to guarantee within our domestic borders the uh, compliance with uh, and the respect of fundamental rights. So I think this... Uh, um, this is an apparent alternative, but I think both things can uh, take place. There can be an uh, exchange in a virtuous circle uh, so that internally and externally we can ensure the um, respect of uh, human rights. And I think that was the, um, the essential point in this debate. I really wish to thank you. We've concluded this first session. I thank these speakers and all the colleagues who've taken the floor and all those who've listened with such patience to what was said. <clears throat> and now we have a coffee break, um, which will be uh, served just outside the room. I would like to um, be on time for the next uh, session. We'll be speaking of uh, data protection and digital rights, and this will be headed by our colleague Donatella Ferrante, um, head of the Justice Committee at the Chamber of Deputies.
Bene. Very well. Let us resume our proceedings with our second session on data protection and new rights in the digital era. We have three um, authoritative speakers, Marco Ljezic, judge of the Court of Justice of the European Union, Giovanni Bozzarelli, assistant European data protection supervisor, and Guido Scorza, who is uh, a professor uh, at the University of Bologna. And let us now open the session, reminding you that there will be a debate after the uh, presentations. So if you wish to speak during the debate, please fill in the um, ad hoc forms so that we can draw up a list of all those wishing to take the floor. Before handing over to the first of our keynote speakers, allow me to remind you that the topic at hand um, is considered a priority by the Italian uh, um, presidency of the EU. There is uh, no doubt that uh, the um, development of uh, the use of the internet uh, calls for appropriate uh, uh, safeguards uh, to avoid fraud, uh, abuse, uh, and to guarantee privacy and uh, the rights of users. The transnational nature of the internet, however, um, calls for um, an approach that uh, uh, goes beyond national borders. Uh, there is a reform package which has been submitted uh, to um, address this issue, and Europe indeed is, uh, um, in fact, spearheading this process. We know that the internet has uh, radically changed the um, patterns of uh, data exchange, uh, the technological and uh, computer um, de technology developments uh, have uh, had an impact uh, on uh, personal data, privacy, and so on. Hence, the need to ensure that um, all those who collect and process uh, personal data should uh, be um, responsible for the, these processes. Uh, we know that in the face uh, of uh, um, a sea change in the ICT sector, there um, is the need to replace uh, bureaucratic protocols uh, with activities that uh, are more focused on the risks uh, deriving from reckless and illicit uh, use uh, of uh, personal data, which can damage um, our citizens. So the aim is to achieve uh, harmonization in the legal framework using uh, um, regulations that uh, can be applied in a uniform fashion by member states without the need for international laws. The Italian uh, Chamber of Deputies, uh, and this was pointed out uh, by um, Ms. Baldrini, the Italian Chamber of Deputies uh, uh, has set up um, an ad hoc uh, working group to uh, examine the guarantees, rights and duties uh, um, for the use of the internet and a draft uh, of the committee's proposal has been uh, circulated uh, as uh, a basic working paper. Our hope is that in the course of today's meeting, we will be able to contribute uh, to the development of um, adequate uh, legislation. We need to guarantee um, personal data protection um, under the um, oversight uh, of uh, competent authorities. We will have to also look at uh, the point of view f um, of this from the point of view of the judiciary and of law enforcement. The short introduction ends here and I will now hand over to the three keynote speakers who will be addressing specific uh, topics uh, um, and each will have 15 minutes. The first uh, is uh, Judge Ilicic, uh, followed by uh, Mr. Buttarelli and uh, Mr. Scorza. Over to you, Mr. Ilicic. Prego. Grazie, signor Presidente. Grazie per l'interesse. Thank you very much. Thank you for this interesting introduction. Well, this is uh, a rare 
opportunity for me to have an exchange with members of parliament. Um, uh, we know that um, only rarely do we have an opportunity uh, to um, engage with uh, uh, members of parliament, uh, the judiciary and uh, um, the legislative bodies are generally separate. Uh, I've been told that it's preferable uh, if I use English, which is what I'm going to do, not least because uh, I have prepared a text uh, in English. So I can't use my mother tongue, Slovenian, so it's going to have to be English. Suppose that um, the Camera dei Deputati invited me to this meeting because I was a reporting judge in the case Google Spain, you may know. And uh, okay, I, I know a little bit something about the pro data protection, but perhaps you will be disappointed. I'm not going to talk a lot of this case. As a reporting judge, as a judge in general, you you are not, I wouldn't say allowed, but authorized or the best placed person to comment your own judgment. You put down, you wrote down everything you wanted to say. So I, I perhaps um, speak a little in a way, uh, in a little more general way, uh, but I couldn't at the end to avoid make making some comments on this case. Why? In principle, we know the rule. Nemo judex in sua propria causa. The judges shouldn't comment their own matters. But as we judges in, at the Court of Justice in Luxembourg, we are not closed in an ivory tower. We do follow what people think about us. And so we read the comments of journalists, of lawyers, of everybody, of politicians concerning our judgments. And sometimes uh, we see, and we regret it, but perhaps it's our fault, that our uh, judgments are not well understood. So I'll make a, a little effort to clarify something about creating judgments of the Court of Justice of the European Union in Luxembourg. That will be the first part of my short introduction. Then I'll uh, face a little bit the general problematic of human rights protection before our court. And at the end, I really concentrate myself on some little issues concerning data protection cases before our court. So, I can imagine that you know the role, the function of the Court of Justice of the European Union, but nevertheless I would like to stress uh, some points which perhaps are not that well known or with, of which we are not, or you are not, people, uh, politicians, lawyers all over the world are not that much aware of. Uh, it's a court created in 1952 in the community, in the steel and coal community at the time, and uh, its role can be very well illustrated by, I, by a quotation. I quote the first president of our court, our, of the predecessor of our court, Massimo Pilotti, the Italian one, the Italian judge, who quoted his compatriot, Dante Alighieri, who wrote in his book, not La Divina Commedia, of course, but it was Monarchia, another political book wrote, written in, in Latin, uh, and he wrote, Ubi litigium esse potest, ibi judicium esse debet. Remember, potest debet in Latin, okay? Where there is a possibility that a conflict arises, 
there must be, there is an obligation to have a judiciary. And this was the idea. So, unfortunately, in our times, already 62 years, uh, two years ago it was the same, you can't avoid conflicts between institutions, between people, between uh, uh, every, everybody. There is no more golden age, Aurea Atas, the Publius Ovidius Naso, so there must be a judiciary. You like it or not? And is it good or not? Okay, of course, everybody would like that, that judges decide well, but it doesn't happen at all the, the times. And there is a big achievement of political and cultural nature in the European Union that you must trust the Court of Justice, knowing that it makes mistake, that judges are human bodies, as you can see, and if I don't look too human, I apologize. So, uh, of course, but it is better than have war, than have quarrels between institutions, so you must trust them. And imagine uh, our work, our task is not that easy. We are 28 judges at the court, 28 judges from 28 different states, member countries, and we have to decide in chambers of three, five, 15, or even 28 judges. It is quite complicated to reach a judgment. And of course, the text of judgments, the final text, is sometimes ambiguous. It's not easy to read, I confess it. I asked the, the organizers to print you out, out the case of Google Spain because I, I wanted to use it like an example, but okay, it doesn't work. Anyhow, I don't have time enough. So, the judgment is a, always a compromise, as in your political life, which you know better than me, you have to make compromises. Our judgments are also compromises, with a big difference if I compare it with parliamentary or government decisions that you never know, the outside people never know, who voted for what. The deliberation is secret and it remains secret. So in this light, you should look at judgments coming out of our court also for the Google Spain judgment, which we'll approach a little bit uh, later. Second point, the Court of Justice of the European Union is not a court for human rights. Sometimes people forget it because we have a special court on human rights in Strasbourg, you know it, which has nothing to do uh, formally with the European Union, it belongs to the Council of Europe, so, uh, and they just defend human rights under the European Com Convention of Human Rights from 1950, and it, that is their main task. We do not approach in a general way human rights. But of course, after the inclusion of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union into the primary law of the European Union that happened on the 1st of December 2009, as you know, we have a new source of law which uh, covers the area of human rights in the European Union. And now, be aware of this fact. It was mentioned this early this uh, afternoon by the uh, Commissioner I heard, uh, Article 6 of the Treaty on European Union. It speaks about human rights. First paragraph. The human rights as regulated in the Charter of the European Union on fundamental rights is one of the general principles of the European law. Paragraph two, 
the Union will accede to the European Convention on Human Rights. Paragraph 3, the, the human rights in, uh, as expressed in the common constitutional tradition of the members of the European Union are to be respected. Okay, I didn't quote it literally, but this is the sense of this Article 6. So, our court has to apply three different sources of law. Charter of EU, European Convention of Human Rights, and the co national constitutions, or common ideas of international, international, um, of national um, constitutions. That is not an easy work huh, for us. We face it often. Uh, I would remind you of the judgment um, Ockerberg Fransen from 2013, a Swedish case, when we had to decide whether the Swiss, Swedish Constitution and the European Convention and uh, our Charter are compatible. It is quite a complicated matter, but I would really don't enter, don't want to enter it much into it. Uh, yes, uh, also this problem of the accession of the European Union to the, to the European Convention uh, of Human Rights has been faced today before, uh, and it was stressed that our court is in a situation to have to decide uh, whether the draft treaty between the European Union and the Council of Europe concerning human access to the Convention is compatible with the EU law. Uh, a demand of the opinion arrived from the European Commission. You will understand the case is pending. Uh, somebody said that the decision will be uh, reached before the end of this year. I'm, I'm not that sure about, but it, uh, it's a secret. And, but you'll understand that I, I'm going to abstain of, of commenting a pending case before our court. Uh, there are other topics concerning human rights which appear often before our court, asylum case, immigration case, cases, uh, terrorist cases, right of defense and so on, but I, I could uh, speak for the whole day about it, so I, I'll skip it. Uh, and let me turn to the third point, the data production data protection cases. Uh, don't, f let's not forget, the court, as any court in this world, does not choose the cases coming before it itself. It depends on parties or on different uh, uh, persons outside of the court. So we can't really en enter into any question which in which a parliament could do, or a government could do, we are just bound on questions as posed to us. And so in, uh, in this year, uh, two, I, I'm not going to evaluate the importance of these cases, but two, let's say, bigger or important cases were decided by our court. It was the Digital Rights Ireland judgment from 8th of April of this year, and it was the Google Spain judgment of the 13th of May of this year. And they merit uh, observations from the part of member states and from the part of the European institutions. Uh, I, I'll just comment in two sentences the Digital Ireland uh, decision uh, it invalidated, our court invalidated the Data Retention Directive, if I may abbreviate the title of it, uh, because it imposed or allowed to member states to retain personal data for a certain period, and our court found out that it was not proportionate. And the directive is invalidated, which has 
a direct impact on the national law, laws which implemented the directive. The German Constitutional Court decided about the validity of this regime, directive, national law, together before, and there are some countries who reacted very soon afterwards. I can't avoid mentioning the Slovenian Constitutional Court, the, the Constitutional Court of my uh, home country, which invalidated the Slovenian law concerning the data retention two or three months after the decision of the Luxembourg Court. It, it was in, in mid-July this year. But let me say two more words about the Google Spain judgment. I, I was, as I said, a reporting judge. I had a big responsibility. I drafted it after a long discussion with my 14 colleagues. It was the Grand Chamber of the Court. And it is like as it is. So you take it or leave it. But it's, it's imposed to the member countries and, the Europe, and to European institutions. There have been hundreds of reactions, public reactions. I haven't read them all, but some of them were very impressive. And I uh, chose to, to terminate my presentation today uh, a title of one of the articles which was published somewhere, I won't quote it. What did the court really say in this case? Because there are a lot of misunderstandings and that may be a fault of the court, of the poor drafting. Imagine, you must know it, huh? the, that we work at the court exclusively in French. Judges just speak French. We draft our texts in French. And then when it is translated into other langu languages, the 23 remaining languages of the European Union, it may lose something. The translation is not an, an easy task, no, especially in, in juridical text. And there were th th three main issues in this uh, case. Okay, it's a long judgment. You can um, read it at any time at the website of the court in all 23 languages. It, uh, concerned, firstly, the territorial application of the European Directive. It was Google who was accused to provide for a link to a page in Spain. This was a preliminary ruling from Audiencia Nacional of Spain. Uh, who, uh, and there was a, a certain person who nowadays is very popular in spite of the fact that, that he demanded data protection. This is uh, some kind of uh, paradox, but you can find the name of Mr. Costeja Gonzalez everywhere. So uh, he, 15 years ago, he didn't pay some debts to, uh, debts to, the, social, to the Spanish social uh, security and there was a procedure and his house was put to an auction, public auction. And after the, the Spanish law, this uh, auction has to be published in a newspaper called Vanguardia of Barcelona. Uh, and it was, it was on the net. And now Google, and now if you tape today, Conseja Gonzalez, sur le Google, Google search, uh, all his stories appear, even this one, which has nothing to do with the actual situation of this person. He paid the debts, uh, the, the case is over. This was the, the factual background of the case. And then uh, there is no problem. The, the, the data, it's personal data, but they were legal, they were legally published, even the Spanish law uh, demanded that th this is public, but of course it has nothing to, to do with the uh, actual situation of this, you know, of this person. Uh, but Google, as you know, 
has its seat in California. So is the European law applicable or not? And don't forget, the directive is from 1995, so 19 years old. The expansion of internet at that time was not like today. There were. So uh, we decided finally that there is, the European law is applicable because Google had a subsidiary in Spain, it was Google Spain, but if, I don't know, if there was, there's no sub subsidiary in Portugal or in, in Slovenia or in some other country, so I'm not sure, but we decided, we uh, responded to the question. The second problem, whether Google was the operator and whether he processed data, we answered with yes, because, uh, it agglomerated the data. You could find the, all the personal data clicking the name. And this is the, the very point of the decision, which is not understood, often not understood. People talk or write about right to be forgotten. Droit d'oubli, derecho all the are, all the are. Uh, you read, it's not true. We didn't decide that a person, we didn't exclude it, but it was not the case, that a person can demand, there was some example given this afternoon about children publishing on, in, on Facebook or anywhere their naked uh, photos. Uh, we didn't decide about this. We don't exclude it, but you must have a look, you must understand the judgment as it is. We decided that Google is not entitled to provide a link to a website information which has been put on the net by a third person. It's not Google which published this story about uh, selling a house of somebody. It's legally published, but you, you must read the judgment. There is a wording on the basis of search by personal name. So you can, of course, if you, if you search by Vanguardia newspaper, you can have a look of all the publication of, publications of this newspaper seen, uh, since 1888, I suppose. It, it's, it started to be edited. Of course, it's no problem, but you can't really find it by name. This is just one small part of the, of the problematic of the data protection on the Internet. So um, our court is not that mightful as somebody could imagine. But of course, cases will arrive and arrive. And I am honored, anyhow, that I see that the European community, community as a community of individuals, has found the judgment important, giving a hint in the direction of better data protections of individuals. But the work is now to be done by others, by the political institutions. We did a, a, a small, a little, part of the uh, of increasing the um, data protection but not anymore thank you my president grazie a lei veramente thank you very much for having brought us your personal experience and uh, in particular for having uh, managed to give um, a lot of significance and also provide us with an authentic reading of that uh, sentence and the message contained in it. And I'd like to give the floor to Giovanni Buttarelli, who is European uh, Deputy Guarantor for Protection of Rights. Quick 15 minutes again. Dear President Ferranti, uh, dear President Finocchiaro, uh, the style of EU institutions is to use one of the three European Union main languages. 
Uh, but differently from my good colleague, Martin Kerum, it would be a pity not to make profit of this fantastic translation. And therefore, with your permission, I will move to uh, my native language, uh, Italian. Uh, to say that la protezione dei dati Protection of personal data is something which is um, going through a historic phase, uh, something which has defined the, a moment of truth. In the last 40 years, there have been other uh, critical and important phases in the way in which at the European Union and um, at the Council of Europe, uh, an important um, page in this uh, area has been dealt with, but never like uh, now, after the revelations which we all know of on the intensive and massive uh, surveillance activities and the uh, first uh, considerations on the big data issue, the decisions taken uh, by the European Union and also by the Council of Europe, as we'll be seeing in coming, um, in the coming months uh, will be extremely important. And so one of the points uh, which is raised is the need for a global response in the digital age, a response which can no longer be entrusted to the um, approach of individual countries or on the part of individual areas. And here we encounter one of the first uh, areas of difficulty since the European approach historically has been addressed to protecting individuals rather than consumers. And the goal of the free circulation of data and harmonization are certainly important, but they are not the only goals. In other countries, the system uh, hinges more on uh, individuals as consumers. And there is greater emphasis on the need to facilitate uh, transporter data flows. In order to uh, face up to this uh, divergence, uh, Europe has begun, uh, begun some time ago to discuss transporter data flows and identified a number of um, solutions which are, which are summarized on this slide. There are some more recent uh, exercises which focus on the harmonization of uh, so-called binding corporate rules with the similar binding uh, corporate rules which exist in the APEC uh, area. And there are major efforts to intensify international cooperation between the authorities um, which uh, oversee privacy and data protection. This is just a summary of some of the recent uh, international instruments which um, with in the OECD and the standards appro approved by the data protection um, authorities. The aim is to ensure sufficient uh, guarantees at the international level. And even uh, purely trade agreements, such as the uh, GATT, also has references on this. GATT, sorry. Uh, here we need to uh, look at the short-term prospects there, which exist in the mother of all uh, conventions, which will be discussed in uh, the coming months, the TTIP. Even though it uh, focuses specifically on trade, it might contain important provisions, even though indirectly important on data protection issues. And whereas uh, some issues like uh, cyber crime, there's been a very rapid procedure of ratification on the part of the member states. Um, the United States ratified this convention very rapidly, but the ratification procedure for other uh, international conventions might well not be so fast. So the question which we have is, um, what should we do in order to obtain greater convergence between the different systems? Uh, Commissioner Reichert um, earlier spoke of the differences of uh, other systems. And uh, the solutions which I've listed here have been uh, posited, but convergence is difficult because 
um, the advances in other countries are not as rapid as we may think. And so people have begun to speak. Some people have begun to speak of interoperability, as if this were a more uh, modest uh, goal compared with convergence and have uh, begun to ask themselves how it would be possible to acquire this interoperability. S would it be simply through mutual recognition of different uh, systems or would more substantial uh, steps forward be necessary? These are examples uh, contained in the instruments I mentioned before where we start from the point of view that the judicial system is different but Uh, attempts are made to make steps forward uh, in the area of enforcement. But as the, the United States, which is a strategic partner for the European Union, probably in the short term will not um, have any major new developments in the area of data protection at the federal level. And so uh, that is why it um, This uh, important document approved in 2012 comes back to the issue of uh, mutual recognition and assesses um, their effect, uh, indicating that the uh, values uh, with the United States shared with, uh, we share common values with the United States, but the methods uh, used to pursue them are, are different. And so we have a a uh, less ambitious approach. What is Europe doing in the meantime? Uh, Commissioner Reichardt uh, spoke of the this package, which is um, a very substantial one and moving ahead. The Italian presidency now have a very important task, which is to achieve a result before the end of the presidency. And here we have a number of very important reasons to have uh, an approach of this kind. In 1990, The Italian uh, Authority for Privacy, headed by Professor Rodotta, held a international conference in uh, Venice, which uh, ended, concluded with a declaration entitled One World, One Privacy. What can we do today in order to obtain this uh, worldwide protection? Do we need a instrument, a legally binding instrument, which is valid for all countries, which would uh, therefore be subject to a signing and ratification procedure. How long would that procedure take? Can we make use of the solution of a uh, legal instrument set up under the aegis of the United Nations, setting up in detail the rights to data protection and privacy as enforceable human rights? or? Could we have an intergovernmental uh, conference which uh, could lead to um, a solution? Other people have um, uh, stressed, have indicated that more modest goals should be pursued on the basis of universally accepted standards without the need for a uh, ratification process, uh, the, int the st Madrid standards, or else even more modestly, a um, universally accepted ISO pri privacy standards. These are all um, positions which are valid. Perhaps it won't be necessary to um, just uh, take one on board and uh, dispose of all the others. What is certain is that the Google case, which uh, the previous speaker has um, discussed, shows that Uh, when there are transboundary um, situations, as in that case, uh, the legal systems find it difficult to operate. The Costea Gonzalez case was uh, easily solved, resolved by the court because many of the features uh, were national in nature. The newspaper La Vanguardia was in that case Spanish. The um, data protection agency which took a decision was Spanish and the Uh, further judgment was also also took part in Spain. Let's think of a case of a publisher who is uh, located in another country and uh, an event happening in another country and a challenge brought in a third country. What would be the um, problems in deciding who would have the competency to decide on the case? So um, we can all 
uh, try and see that uh, how in the area of data protection, not just privacy, or how we can um, improve a global approach. The authority I represent uh, is very supportive of the reform uh, being discussed in Brussels for the reasons outlined here. Um, and certainly because of the changes uh, which have uh, occurred with the Charter of Fundamental Rights, a new article in the Lisbon Treaty on the new fundamental right to protection of individual data. It's uh, a, a fragmentary system. It's no longer um, possible. We have a system which strengthens the uh, rights of stakeholders, um, focuses on the accountability of people who process data. There are some flaws in uh, consistency, particularly because of the division among two legal instruments, but it is a major opportunity to have uh, authoritative standards vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. Um, why? Because this reform will apply to anybody in the world, uh, even the um, information technology giants providing services and products to uh, people living in the European Union, not necessarily um, nationals of the European Union or um, and, and uh, which um, have methods to follow up a person. It doesn't necessarily need to be a negative action. And uh, here I'm referring to an article according to which all companies which um, investigating authorities of other countries located outside the European Union uh, to provide, provide information will have to uh, do that to uh, we'll have to contact the uh, data protection agency before providing this information. You'll recall the Swift case and the issues which this raised. Council, the council is uh, discussing a reformulation of this article, and this is an important uh, point, which remains to be considered. Um, among the challenges, and I'm moving towards my conclusion, the reform will have to face up to. There are some points which I think. Uh, are worthwhile discussing today. First of all, this European um, reform will uh, lead to considerable progress in the area of harmonization, but it won't harmonize all rules. Certainly, the uh, national provisions, which are substantially a photocopy of the European regulation, will have to be uh, repealed, but some national provisions will remain in force, particular, particularly in areas such as e-government and uh, healthcare, journalism, where the legal systems of member countries are more diverse or where uh, the, it has been decided to give more scope to member states. Let us just think of e-government, um, what will happen in this area. Second um, challenge is that on the one hand, there's a uh, momentum towards certainty of law and uh, no reduction of guarantees and having clear provisions, as well as a uh, concern about uh, reduction in levels of protection. Um, and at the same time, we're moving towards big data and we will need to have provisions which are stable and neutral over time for us the society which uh, we will have at least till 2025. We can't think of these rules being reviewed before that date. And, and we have the problem of um, uh, big data in which there, we don't only have uh, personal data. In italic, uh, we have quoted a White House document which was published this year which tries also to um, consider the advantages of big data, but also the risks um, in relation to surveillance and um, protection. The uh, European authorities have uh, said that big data is an important challenge, but um, it does not uh, mean that the principles in discussion should be re-examined. 
probably we don't have all the um, answers to deal with the ethical issues in uh, big data. This is just a summary of the difficulties we have. And which will happen in the short term in order to apply these um, discussions in Brussels. So when our representative bodies, council and parliament, try to find a consensus on a reform which has now been discussed for a long time. These principles are beginning not so much to be strained, but I think we really need to think about how to apply them. If we think of the uh, of technological development and how uh, easy it's going to be to identify people starting from anonymous data. If we think of the um, clarity of roles, there will be an unlimited uh, possibility of processing this data, uh, making use of software which uh, will be able to develop even in ways unforeseen and uncontrolled by their designers and uh, we can and there will be uh, modes of information which will flow into a made big box and which will consider concern lots of um, people altogether and uh, this would uh, lead to an aggregate picture of ours which will lead to uh, further discussion so i leave you with this uh, conclusion where in general and this is the position of all the authorities of the 28 EU uh, members, we need to deal with this issue uh, as Europe. We need to focus on the existing principles, but we also need to be able to see um, how these can be applied practically and effectively. And we need to find innovative and practical ways to um, apply these measures, which should lead to the uh, international dissemination of a European digital habeas corpus. And so I think that the discussion today and uh, the idea of making the draft uh, uh, public is an initiative which uh, should be commended. Belgium, uh, a very important country in Europe, has um, taken a very important uh, political decision in this area uh, by appointing a minister for privacy. So uh, this is uh, perhaps the first example, and it shows that alongside the issue of fundamental rights, this is one of the main frontiers of democracy. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very insightful and comprehensive presentation, and thank you for the extreme honesty that you have shown in listing the difficulties that uh, have to be addressed uh, um, um, in the uh, context of uh, transnational and national uh, protection of data. Now, Guido Scorza uh, from the University of Bologna. He um, is professor specialized in uh, digital technologies. Thank you very much, Chair person. Thank you for the invitation. I think that I have been privileged to have been able to attend such a, a unique, extraordinary meeting, something that uh, we will remember um, for a long time to come, given that we've been talking about being remembered or not. And I I say this because uh, uh, we believe that um, the draft uh, declaration stating fundamental rights uh, within the framework of the internet is uh, a truly historic um, milestone. And this is the result of the work of a committee that was set up within uh, uh, the parliamentary context, but we know that uh, this committee have be has benefited from the contribution of uh, experts uh, from um, civil society. The title of my presentation uh, already indicates what my ambition is, and allow me to thank uh, Mr. Rudota, who chaired this committee and who is present here with us today. I think that 
the work of this committee um, will be remembered in history. Uh, it is late, and I imagine that a lot of people are keen to end this meeting, however interesting it uh, may be. And I think that uh, there is a starting point that uh, we should all, uh, I think, remember. The internet uh, is uh, not uh, el an elsewhere. Um, we have people who are termed internet users, but we're talking about 500 millions of European citizens uh, um, who use the internet. Now, I believe that, as I said, today is a very special day indeed. And when we say that fundamental rights of citizens must be granted and effectively enforced even um, to online activities. And when it comes to, for instance, the uh, recognition of these rights, uh, it's essential that uh, they have to be recognized uh, within the um, internet uh, and uh, um, the, I don't think I'm revealing a secret if I tell you that in fact the internet is pervasive it is tentacular um, we are progressively transferring pieces of our identity of our personal identity online so this is I think the fundamental place where our rights will have to be safeguarded uh, um, as citizens. Where else can we uh, safeguard our right to personal identity, freedom of association, freedom of communication, if not online? So my point of view is that uh, we either are ready to implement with all the necessary energy enthusiasm, fund the safeguarding of fundamental rights uh, online or else. Uh, we have to surrender to the fact that Europe is going to be different. Um, I think that we cannot afford to miss this opportunity. Um, otherwise, we would run the risk of uh, not being able to safeguard uh, the rights of citizens uh, um, in in the internet uh, and uh, there are a few points that I would like to share with you and that uh, I would like to focus on in the course of my presentation. Firstly, online citizens are unwittingly surrendering, as Stephen or Robert I would say, the right to have rights. Citizens are, are, are finding themselves in a position whereby human rights are no longer recognized as they ought to be. Take, for instance, the example of that exchange of uh, bits of our personal identity that occur online as a result of the process to acquire the right to use a service in exchange for, and at times unknowing, a provision of bits of our personal identity. And this certainly will leave its mark. There are more aspects that have to be considered and that are a source of concern, which I would like to share with you. The risk is that in the future, in the public uh, um, ICT space, so there will be fewer rights uh, guaranteed. We know that there are gigantic playgrounds in our states, and these rules are being imposed. In fact, there is indeed no rule that is more enforced than so-called terms of use uh, of providers of online services. No one in the world, I think,
can claim that uh, they have successfully enforced their rights uh, um, vis-a-vis -vis citizens as much as global service providers. This isn't true of Europe, it isn't true of any country. And, uh, and as an observer of um, the internet, I cannot but affirm that the state is stepping back from its lawmaking role in uh, terms of uh, regulating um, interactions and transactions. Private rules are, are um, prevailing in terms of uh, um, establishing the terms and conditions of professional relationships and uh, uh, negotiations. Everything is governed by the principles of business and not by the principles of democracy, and that must be a source of concern. And then there's a third consideration I wish to make that um, makes me say that when we talk about the in, an Internet Bill of Rights, uh, we're simply saying that uh, human rights uh, and the rights of citizens uh, uh, have to be uh, guaranteed in the future in the name of security, in the name of uh, uh, certain rights such as copyright. Uh, we're rapidly seeing the acceptance of the fact that all that is technically possible to solve a problem ought to be considered as lawful and politically acceptable. Obviously that is not the case. Having this belief means that we're abdicating our right to govern the system. And I would like to illustrate this statement with three examples. In France, Parliament is about to approve the so-called anti-terror law, which would attribute to the Ministry of the Interior the power to block, through internet service providers, access to certain content. In Turkey, the Constitutional Court has, fortunately, declared as illicit, unlawful, a provision that gave the um, competent authority the possibility of removing content. In Italy, administrative judges have uh, uh, invested the Constitutional Court with a uh, um, case of legitimacy to establish whether our independent communications authority is responsible for the removal of content, content online um, in order to guarantee copyright or to leave it online. I think that there is an urgent need for action on our part and European citizens require an Internet Bill of Rights. Today, whether we realized it or not, I think we witnessed the birth of uh, the initial seeds of this Internet Bill of Rights, an Internet Bill of Rights uh, in which citizens can find solutions to the problem of seeing their rights upheld and respected in uh, the Internet. I would like to uh, add a few more remarks, uh, and I obviously look forward to the debate. And in closing, allow me to share with you some of the fundamental principles that need to be included in the Internet Bill of Rights of our country and of the European continent. Firstly, every citizen should have equal right to access to the Internet, and we need to have a neutral system without any discrimination on the internet and this is a prerequisite it's not even a right because in the in our information society lack of access to the internet in a non-discriminatory fashion means that individuals cannot enjoy any other right and, nor any other freedom and then there is another principle which i believe we cannot afford to 
set aside that at least fundamental rights in the country of destination of any online service uh, are complied with. So it's mandatory compliance of at least fundamental rights in the country of destination of any online service. There should be no market approach that allows that a European citizen be denied fundamental rights whilst using a service provided by uh, an entity in another country. And then another fundamental right which I believe requires very careful um, attention, any restriction on the use of the internet is inexorably a uh, restriction on personal freedom because in the information society every human action, every action on the part of a citizen uh, um, has a necessary precondition electronic communication and therefore any restriction placed upon European citizens and denying them freedom to communicate uh, electronically is a form of restriction of personal freedom. So we have to imagine a new article um, for the Convention on uh, Human Rights summarizing the content of Article 5 on the right to freedom, um, to liberty and security, Article 10, freedom of expression, Article 11, freedom of assembly and association. So all these freedoms in an information society require freedom uh, in terms of electronic communication. If that is denied, all other rights are denied. Previous speakers have already, far better than I could, um, stressed the importance of privacy and the protection of personal identity in our information society. And this means that I can um, uh, skip some of the points I intended to make. Others have made them before me. Uh, there's no doubt that in the Internet Bill of Rights, which I imagine um, online domicile, including the cloud, which we talk about, is to be safeguarded, it is inviolable. And certainly, now that I'm approaching the end of my time allotment, there's one last remark that I would like to make. And, and this is certainly not a minor point. This is the last subject I have time to address at this point. We need to re re uh, review Article 17 of the Convention, uh, which is about prohibition of abuse of rights, because abuse of rights uh, in uh, our time and age uh, in the, on the Internet uh, is common. Day after day, we witness episodes of self-justice and... Uh, in the name of some rights, the rights of others are repressed. And it's almost as if the code, the software code, which controls all platforms is progressively replacing codes, i.e. the laws that govern us. The difference between the code software and the codes laws is that uh, the code is uh, developed in a business context, whereas codes um, are written to guarantee democracy. And so I would much rather be governed by codes than by a code. Uh, I feel more guaranteed if my rights are, are protected by laws, our codes, than by software, the code. And this is an essential aspect. No one um, sh will be able or should be able to abuse others' rights. So there should be no abuse of rights. Codes or laws must have 
a more preeminent role than code, the code or software. Thank you very much and I look forward to uh, the discussion. So we finished the keynote uh, speeches and I wish to thank all of the keynote speakers for their input. I'm now opening the discussion. We already have people on the list and so I will give um, people four minutes to um, comment because there may be other people on the list. The first person, uh, Cesary Tomczyk from Poland. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, for the first, uh, thank you for such interesting topic. I think it's very modern and very interesting, really. Uh, the simplest definition of privacy was formulated over, over 100 years ago in USA, and it says that the privacy is the right to be let alone. And although with the passage of time changed, the approach to the right to privacy is essential elements remain uh, unchanged. We are faced with challenge that requires the uh, establishment of modern, coherent, and uniform uh, framework for data protection in the EU, which will enable the development of digital economy to the internal market, uh, ensure individuals control over their own data and improve legal certainty for economic operators and public authorities. The proposed standards should increase responsibility of data administration, administrators for the treatment of personal data. One of the innovation in the legislation on, on personal data protection is to enable data subject to remove information uh, concerning his person, which has already been released to network. In the co context of this law should be mentioned the judgment of the Court of Justice of European Union, um, Mr. Um, Mr. Marco uh, Ilesic uh, tell, uh, told us uh, about a few very interesting uh, things about uh, the Google uh, Spain and the uh, Court of Justice recognized the right of individuals to remove personal data uh, subject to certain um, conditions. So we have, um, like I said before, the right to be let alone and this is still a very important thing and now also uh, we have a right to be forgotten. For example, in Poland, a uh, few hundred people send a request to Google after, uh, after May. Um, I wonder how it looks like in Italy and other countries. In relation uh, to the facts, uh, uniform legal framework will help uh, build the potential of the digital market that will improve economic growth, innovation, and will help create new jobs. Regulation will put an end to the fragmentation uh, of the legal system of the 27 member states and remove barriers to enter the market. And uh, I think I could say that I, I would like to live in the time when we can uh, trust the Internet. Uh, more trust in Internet means uh, more trade in Internet. More trade in Internet means uh, more jobs. Uh, and big growth in the uh, economy. So uh, uh, I, I could say for the end that, uh, uh, like Mr. Skoza said, we need an Internet Bill of Rights because uh, the real trust in the Internet uh, would be then if, we, if, the, if the citizens have the rights in the global network. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Not least because you stuck to the time allotment. Over to Burhan Kutsu, Turkey. Mr. Pre Mr. Dear Secretariat, we, thank, we are thankful for the very valuable pre presentations. Kişisel veri en basit anlamı ile belirli veya kimliği belirlenebilir bir kişiye ilişkin bütün bilgileri ifade eder. 
In simplest terms, uh, personal data refers to the all uh, sets of concepts that can be traced uh, to, to a specific individual who is traceable and detectable. Kişisel bilgileri vermemek elimizde değildi. Nüfusta kaydımız var, tapuda bir takım kayıtlarımız var, internette, yolculukta kayıtlarımız var. Bu bakımdan e, bu bilgileri vermemediği bir lüksümüz yok. It is inevitable for individuals not to give the, his or her uh, personal information because we are all registered at the state level uh, of a data database built by the state authorities. Bütün mesele bunları kötüye kullanıp kullanmaması meselesi. Dijital alanda yeni tehlikeler ve sanal ortamdaki kişi haklarının korunması bu işi zorlaştırmaktadır. The point is to preserve this data and prevent it from uh, being manipulated or uh, used for other uh, evil purposes. But the point is uh, to preserve and uh, keep this personal data in a, a safe way. Özellikle terör alanındaki yeni gelişmeler devletleri teyakkuz haline getirmekte daha tedbirli olarak birçok kişi şüpheli olarak incelemeyi almaktadır. Especially in the developments in uh, some uh, areas related to terrorist activities, the states are getting increasingly alerted and this situation pushes them to be more defensive. Devletler veya kişiler farklı kullanma durumunda bu verileri, kişisel bilgileri yapılması gereken herhalde tazminat hukuku başta olmak üzere ceza alanında bir takım cezalandırma tekniklerine gitmektir. And this definitely requires some new techniques in criminal law, especially when it comes to punishing and uh, verdict, uh, judging the people who are committed in such activities. Bu bağlamda baktığımız zaman Avrupa Birliği müktesebatında ve düzenlemelerinde bu alanın çok uh, net bir şekilde olmadığını görüyoruz. Güvenceli bir alan olmadığını uh, görebiliyorum. Ve insan hakları evrensel bildirgesi olsun, Avrupa insan hakları sözleşmesi olsun bunlara dolaylı olarak değinmiş bu meseleyi. Doğrudan bu konuyu inceleyen e, sadece e, bir belge var. O belgeye de baktığımız zaman o da e, Avrupa e, Konseyi'nin düzenlediği yeni bir belge. Uh, when, it, when it comes to specifically uh, taking these issues, especially uh, from the national security perspective, I can't see any tangible document or a concept, uh, in particular European uh, Declaration of Human Rights and also Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I think uh, the EU and the other Western concepts uh, should take this notice uh, in a in more serious manner. Avrupa Birliği'nin direktif ve e, tüzüğü çerçevesinde bazı tedbir alınması öngörülmüş. Ama daha çok bu konu Avrupa Birliği Adet Divanı'nın kararlarıyla belli olmaya başlamıştır. The ten tendency towards taking some concrete steps have been seen in the some uh, rulings of European uh, Court of Justice. Bu manada ilgili direktif ve denetlemeler, denetleyici düzenlemeler yani tüzük e, vesaire Bu konuda e, bütün Avrupa Birliği ülkelerinde yeni bir takım kurullar kurulmasını öngörüyor. Such steps e, foresee the establishment of new institutions in the EU members. Ama kuruldaki üyelerin nitelerini saymamış. Bu konuda e, Avrupa Birliği Adet Divanı'nın bazı kararları var. Objektif ve tarafsız olması gerektiğini, dış etkilerden bağımsız olması gerektiğini kurul üyelerinin siyaset ki dışında kalması gerektiğini karara bağlamış. But this legislation does not uh, does not has not, does not provide any specific definition for such institutions such as uh, of whom these will be comprised of under what circumstances and regulations they will operate. Bilgi çağında toplanan bu veriler kişisel veriler ekonomik olarak kullanıldığı için sonuç itibariyle kişinin verisinin korunmasıyla bundan yarar sağlayan gruplar arasındaki dengede kişinin kaybettiğini görüyoruz. Unfortunately we, we observe that in the equation where uh, the individual and the economic interests have clashed, unfortunately we see that the individual is on the losing side when it comes to make economic benefits of the information. Teşekkür ederim. Thank you all.
Grazie. Thank you. Thank you, and over to Baroness Joyce Quinn. I wanted just to uh, begin by making a, a comment on the draft declaration um, on internet rights that we have in front of us, which I feel makes some very good points about the need for protecting people and safeguarding their rights in the, the digital age. And I think uh, follows on very well from the presentations that we've had this afternoon. Uh, it is a challenging area, however, because the Internet does have a life of its own and develops in unexpected ways. Uh, and uh, certainly, since the 1995 directive was uh, introduced, uh, life has changed very considerably indeed. Um, but despite those challenges, people and our citizens have rights and they need to have redress, particularly when information about them is inaccurate, false, uh, even defamatory. Um, I had put down to speak uh, before I heard Judge Ileshish uh, talk about the European Court of Justice and the Google Spain case, and I found what he had to say very illuminating. Um, but I did want to point out to colleagues that um, the House of Lords did do a report on data protection, including uh, on the so-called right to be forgotten. And what the committee did was express concern that um, to give people an, a sort of a blanket right to be forgotten, uh, while we understood the motivations behind it, might well be very difficult to enforce and could be uh, unworkable in, in the current situation. At the very least, we needed to confront the difficulties before finalizing a, a new directive. Um, once information which, which is accurate, even though it may be old, uh, and lawfully available, is out uh, on the net, it is very difficult to delete it totally from the system. And if I understood what the judge said correctly, that um, it was possible to uh, remove uh, a reference relating to doing a search on a particular individual, but that didn't mean that the information couldn't be found anywhere after a particular search. And I think that does show what a challenge we, we face in this sphere. And as Signor Buttarelli said, we have to try and ensure that we're not surprised by rapid developments. Uh, let me say I'm not proposing a specific amendment to, to um, the, the text that we have in front of us, which I think is, is a good text. I simply wanted to draw attention to the work of my colleagues uh, on this issue and, uh, and say that the report that they'd done was available, uh, which does deal with the difficulty of exercising people's rights in this particular instance. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you. Uh, Ahmed Imaya. Teşekkür ediyorum. Divanı tekrar değerli üyelerle birlikte saygıyla selamlıyorum. Thank you and I would like to greet the honorable secretary once again. Tabii yüksek heyet 5 saattir çok kaliteli beyin proteinini tattı. <gülüyor> the, the participants and other members have enjoyed the very qualified brain storming uh, under this chamber. Yorucu bir çalışma. Ancak ben e, bu çalışmaya şu andaki gündem konusuna sosyal medya açısından bir katkıda bulunmak istiyorum. And I would like to individually contribute to this uh, uh, uh, exchange of views in terms of social media. Dijital teknoloji bugün insanla çok büyük fırsatlarla birlikte kendi özgürlük alanını tahrip edecek tehlikeler de sunuyor. Today, the digital technology provides unique opportunities for human freedom, but on the other side, it, uh, it has the potential to pose a significant threat to the uh, human uh, liberties. Sayın Sukraza ve uh, Butarelli'nin uh, değerlendirmelerini, akademik tahlillerini zevkle izledim. Uh, we, I, I, I highly benefited the academic perspectives brought by Mr. Scorza and Mr. Butarelli. İki üç hususa özellikle işaret etmek istiyorum. Dijital alan teknolojisiyle olmasa bile hukukuyla henüz yeni oluşmakta olan bir alan. Yeni 
yeni oluşan alanlarda normatif düzenlemeler pek tavsiye edilmez. In such newly growing areas the normative regulations are not recommended. Oluş sürecinde oluşturulan ilkeler buza yazılan yazılar gibi olur bazen. During such initial phases the recommendations and the proposals brought by are no more than writing on the water. Doğrusu inşaatların gelişimine bıraktıktan sonra alan belli bir birikime ulaştıktan sonra normatif düzenlemeye gitmektir. After the jurisprudences and other practices have obtained their own common ground, it will be best to build the main legal structure. Sosyal medya alanında daha çok haklar üzerinde duruyoruz. Bu doğru değil. Sorumluluklar ve riskler üzerinde de durmamız lazım. When it comes to social media, we put our emphasis on rights, but we also need to focus on responsibilities and rights to be protected. Özellikle medya zemini olan interneti işleten kişinin, tüzel kişinin veya gerçek kişinin ülke dışında olması halinde gerçekten sorumlulukların takibi bakımından çok büyük zorluklar doğuyor. When the operator is outside of the sovereign borders of a specific country, then it becomes increasingly hard for the legal local authority to intercept and evaluate the responsibility and those who are potentially responsible. Keza söz gelimi yarı geceleri saat 03'te herhangi etkili bir birim toplumu silahla sokağa çıkınız dediği zaman idarenin önlem almamasının getirdiği sosyal yıkım ve riskleri göz ardı edemeyiz. Likewise, when an organization calls for armed rebellion in the midnight, on the other side the state authorities cannot do anything against it to prevent, so there is something that needs to be handled at this point. Yine bu alanda kişi hakları bakımından temel tehlikelerden birisi de istihbari olmayan adli dinlemelerdir. And another potential threat for individual rights is that phone tappings made by only some authorities rather than justice authorities. Bir devlet birimi içerisinde bürokrasi ile savcılık ve yargının ilegal şekilde işbirliği içerisinde dinlemelerin gerçekleşmesi halinde dünya dijital fasizme dikkat çekmek zorundadır değerlendirmek zorundadır. The world needs to focus on the digital fascism when some circles in the bureaucracy feel themselves able to phone tapping just because of their own concerns. Bu noktada özgürlüklerin temel güvencesi olan yargı bağımsızlığı ve yargı güvencesiyle birlikte jüristokrasi tehlikelerini mutlaka değerlendirmeliyiz. And we need to take the consideration of the danger of jüristokrasi which will be imposed through some judicial organs which can also pose threat on the freedom of the society as well. Özgürlük alanı yalnızca anayasa alanı, yalnızca diğer düzenleme alanı, alanı değil, aynı zamanda yaptırımlar ve ceza hukuku alanıdır. Area of liberty and freedom is not only related with the constitution and other legal procedures. It is also about responsibility and when it also sanctions in terms of legal possibility. Italia ceza doktrini ve ceza uygulaması yargısı 1903 yılında dünyaya muhteşem bir araç sundu. Italian criminal doctrine has presented a perfect example to the world in 1903. Delil yasağı, bunun adı delil yasağı. And it is mostly defined as the imposition for evidence. Bireysel görüşüme göre adli dinlemelerin suçüstü halleri için delil değeri tanınması, dinlemelere delil değeri tanınması, onun dışında sadece yardımcı işlev yüklenmesi gerekir. In my personal view, the phone tappings made by the judicial channels bütün bu can only have impact if they are based on responsible. Tabi zor bir konuyla sorunla işin doğasından kaynaklanıyor. Yoksa zihnin çözüm üretememesinden değil, zor bir tabiatı tam anlaşılamamış zor bir sorunla karşı karşıyayız. The nature of this issue is indeed complex, so we cannot, we are not in a position to fully understand and perfectly evaluate it. Dünya hukuk öğretisinin Venedik Komisyonu'nun, İnsan Hakları Avrupa Mahkemesi'nin 
ve Avrupa Komisyonu Mahkemesi'nin ve şu andaki değerli komisyonun bu konuda büyük görevleri var. And uh, this delegation, as well as the Venedik Commission uh, and other European legal structures have a high responsibility in regulating this area according to the priorities of the countries. Çok saygılar sunuyor. Presenting my due respect. Adesso è Soteris. Soteris Samson now has the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Internet uh, knows of no national boundaries, right? And it is there, and it therefore demands an international response. This in turn raises questions and new, new complex legal issues, especially when one takes into consideration Internet's open-ended structure and the never-ending changing and evolving technology, which makes it next to impossible to create an effective long-term legal framework to regulate it. I assume that the basic legal question to be dealt with is the very nature of the legal framework desired to be put in place. Should the priority be placed on the protection of users or should their rights be limited because ensuring security and preventing Possiamo riprovare? Can we try again? Forse può provare. Could you try? Should we move on? Move on with? Can you try another microphone nearby, perhaps? A different microphone. Proviamo. Let's try. Thank you. Shall I start from the beginning or shall I continue? Da dove si era fermato va bene. From where you were is fine, I think. So as I was saying, what it comes down to is whether we want to turn the European Union into a vast police state or whether we really want to protect the fundamental individual rights of, of the users. The Court of Justice, the European Court of Justice, in the joint cases C-293 and 594, 2012, has greatly contributed to the process of creating a new legal framework by laying down a set of essential principles to be adhered to. We respectfully submit that a balance should be achieved between the need to combat crime and the necessity to protect individual rights of the Internet users, with the latter, of course, unquestionably being of higher moral and ethical value than, than the former, and in full accordance and harmony with any concept of the rule of law. Um, other than uh, what Mr. Buttarelli and Mr. Scorza mentioned in their interventions, with which I agree fully, at the very least, I propose that in, an, in, in any effort to create a new legal framework, we should take into consideration at least the limitation of fundamental rights should only apply insofar as it is, as it is strictly necessary. EU law must lay down clear and precise rules governing the scope of these limitations and the safeguards for individuals there is a need to implement substantive conditions such as an objective, an objective criterion by which the number of people authorized to have access to this data is set or a procedural criterion such as review by an administrative authority or a court prior to access to this data is given or more importantly the time span within which this data can be retained and used by the authorities. In light of the above, in, in concluding, in light of the above, 
As a general principle, we concur with the draft, the draft declaration and we strongly believe that any new European legal framework and initiative should reflect the long-established European values and in no way should it lead to a regression of the protection of these rights, liberties and dignity of the net users as currently afforded by the EU member states. Thank you. Grazie. Riza Turmen. Thank you over to Mr. Turmen. The, well, it is quite true that the internet, the use of internet raises many questions, sensitive legal questions. It, it does transcend national boundaries. It does demand an international response. This is all very true. But we should not forget that uh, internet freedom is part of freedom of expression and uh, surveillance of the states over personal data is dangerously increasing. We should be very uh, aware of this danger for personal freedoms, for the freedom of expression. And when we're talking about um, restrictions under one uh, excuse or another uh, to be brought to this uh, free internet freedom, we should also be clear about the safeguards that such restrictions uh, should contain, should entail. Um, in this context, the Court of Justice's recent uh, judgment declaring the data retention directive to be invalid is an important uh, decision because it does contain specific uh, safeguards. The, the judgment is based on the, the generalized manner of the uh, directive it encompasses all individuals, all means of electronic communication. Uh, the directive fails to lay down any objective criterion. Um, the, the directive, the court says, um, as far as the period is concerned, is, is not acceptable, and, and it does not have sufficient safeguards to ensure effective protection against the risk of abuse. Now, all these criterion are not very much different from the Rotaro versus Romania judgment of the European Court of Human Rights. Um, my good friend and colleague, uh, Maruste from Estonia, uh, he knows this judgment very well. He was a sitting judge, uh, as well as uh, I was a sitting judge at this ju judgment. Um, this judgment lays down the limits on the exercise of uh, restrictions. It does say, uh, it, it, it does find a, a violation of Article 8 of, of right to privacy on the ground that the domestic law does not define the kind of information that may be recorded, the categories of people against whom surveillance measures uh, may be taken, the circumstances in which so, such measures may be taken, and the length of time. It is on these grounds that the court of, European Court of Human Rights found a violation. But what is important in this judgment, I think, more important, is that the court says that secret surveillance to be compatible with Article 8, uh, right to privacy of the Convention, they must contain safeguards established by law which apply to the supervision of the relevant services activities, and it says Supervision procedures must follow the values of a democratic society. <coughs> in particular, the rule of law, uh, which is expressed in the Convention, um, that the interference of the executive authorities with an individual's rights should be subject to effective supervision, which should normally be carried out by the judiciary. So when we're talking about supervision of the safeguards, we should leave room for the judiciary to be part of it. Um, in Turkey, the situation is uh, not very bright. Um, all these criterions that I have uh, mentioned are not uh, included in the law uh, which is uh, effective right now. Under the, the, uh, the law that we have on internet, the, uh, 
content providers, service providers uh, are obliged to submit all traffic data to the telecommunications presidency, which is a government agency, without a court decision. And in this way, the government agency has a, a limitless access to personal data. Now, this should be read together with the intelligence uh, agency law, because intelligence agency in Turkey has the power to get every kind, to obtain every kind of information from every source. And... La invito a concludere. Yeah, so this is the uh, situation. And the, uh, one last thing, in the progress report of the uh, European Union on this issue, it says that, first of all, Turkey must adopt a general law on the protection of personal data um, in line with the uh, Council of Europe's Convention on Data Protection. And secondly, there needs to be an independent data protection authority, which doesn't exist now in Turkey. Thank you very much. Allora, adesso Diego De Laurentiis now has the floor. Sì, grazie, Presidente. Yes, thank you, Chair. I am uh, taking the floor uh, in this forum, first of all, to thank the eminent uh, speakers and also the discussants. I am speaking as a member of the uh, committee which drafted that document to uh, reiterate that that document is obviously a draft because in uh, the space of a few months, it wasn't possible to do a, a deal comprehensively with all the issues which are being uh, brought up here. In fact, many of the points which have been made here were the subject of discussion at uh, our meetings in uh, preparing the draft. This is something which uh, reassures me because it shows that uh, the same discussion is being held on many issues in many countries. However, I think it was uh, right to issue a very strong signal from the institutions, from institutions uh, of our attention to these uh, issues. It would not be acceptable for public opinion not to um, receive a sign that these are central issues for the institutions too. We hope that the public consultation, which will last four months, um, in line with the uh, European ones, will make it possible to uh, enrich and uh, supplement this document. And I'm saying this because there are entire chapters, such as um, intellectual property rights, which haven't been mentioned deliberately in this document, because these are issues which are obviously political in nature, too. And so in that uh, forum, no consensus position was uh, achieved. We hope that from the public consultation, uh, new items will emerge which will allow us to supplement the document. I will uh, certainly be uh, relaying your, po your positions to, the, to our group so as to include all the points which have been brought up in our discussion uh, there. I also want to take advantage of being here to um, raise another point. It may seem to be paradoxical, but in Italy, uh, it was in Italy that we find ourselves drafting this document. Italy is one of the uh, last countries to have uh, widespread access to um, the internet and um, wide band, uh, broadband access. And it will therefore probably take a lot, some time between the enunciation of principles and the real enjoyment of rights on the part of the population. But this is not, uh, should not excuse us from uh, trying to 
um, steer a path, and uh, we have uh, followed a path which has already been um, built by others. We referred to the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union because we believe that digital citizenship is not totally disconnected from uh, the other dimensions of citizenship, but it is a further dimension, and uh, it is a dimension which should make it possible to extend, extend uh, inviolable uh, human and civil rights of all people, and not just in the European Union. Thank you also for this um, input from the working group, and the last person on my list is uh, Deborah Skimbri. And thanks for the very lively discussion. Um, it's always good to have rights. It's also good to have, obviously, digital rights. Um, and usually when we speak in the language of rights, we tend to remember very much who is using those rights, the individual rights of people using the Internet. But we tend to forget a little bit um, the rights of victims who are victims of those users. And therefore, um, sometimes a balance is not struck between the two. And I would like us all to remember um, that the Internet can be um, the source of things that are very good for a lot of people, but also um, it can be the source of anguish to people who are victims of abuse uh, on the Internet. And therefore, when we speak of rigorously um, giving rights to users, we should also think of rigorously regulating abuse of those rights. Um, Vulnerable people are constantly being bullied on the Internet, including children. And therefore, uh, we have a very uh, vulnerable group that needs to be taken care of. It is also a group of people who are being basically attacked in the most private um, areas of their lives, in their homes. Usually, traditionally, bullying was in the schoolyard. It was there, and you went out of the schoolyard, and you, you escaped it. But now, when it comes to the Internet, it is where you usually escape to that the bullying is actually happening. And therefore, we need to be very, very careful of regulating uh, abuse. The sheer dimension of the Internet makes a problem millionfold, because before, if it was just a couple of people um, bullying you in the schoolyard, it was two people. Now, um, that same bullying uh, is taken on the Internet, and a lot of people actually aggregate against a, a, a child, and that child feels so vulnerable that we have had children losing their lives over it, and this is, it has become that serious. Um, we need to protect our children, but not only our children, even adults are being attacked on the Internet. And as a, a lawyer in private practice, I do family law, and I find that a lot of vulnerability, uh, there is a lot of vulnerability with domestic uh, abuse cases that are taken over to the Internet, and people are continuously attacked. People have been losing jobs because uh, an, an aggravated um, husband or wife actually goes and says things that aren't true on the Internet. And therefore, we need to be uh, even protective of, of our adults, not just our children. It is true that we don't want to be a police state. It is true that we don't want to be overburdened with too many laws and regulations. However, um, when you realize that, that when abuses on the Internet take, take place, um, they are very difficult to get hold of and they are very difficult to reverse, um, then we need to really uh, think hard of what kind of punishment that deserves especially if we're going to give rights that are ample. We should also uh, take note of um, regulating abuses very harshly. Thank you very much. Grazie. Thank you. Before we hand over to the speakers, 
May I say that this has been an extremely interesting uh, and insightful debate on a topic that uh, is anything but easy to address. And there are two additional questions that uh, I would like to ask. Uh, firstly, after the Google Spain uh, ruling, uh, which established some important principles and considering the European Commission's data protection uh, package um, propositions, do we still feel the need for the European Union's legislation to, to include the decisions and of various um, courts, does case law, in other words, have to feature in um, European uh, um, legislation at this point? And the second question, or rather uh, a comment, given that the European Union is hoping to review and uh, update its legislative framework. Don't you think that the European Union can successfully overcome the concerns of some countries, such as the United States and others, encouraging them to use more balanced uh, solutions to see users as persons and not as consumers, so that uh, democratic concerns can prevail over commercial um, concerns. These are just additional thoughts that I would like to um, share with you. The, the debate is ongoing, and I'm um, happy to be able to join you um, in this discussion on uh, something which uh, is obviously still of interest to um, our respective parliaments. We have, in fact, a request for the floor from um, a senator. Francesco Campanella from the Italian Senate has the floor. Grazie. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the speakers and uh, um, Ms. Boldrini and the Parliamentary Committee for the work that um, it has done in the Italian Senate. We're working on similar uh, projects. There is um, a draft uh, bill on the subject uh, of access to the internet, and this um, would uh, refer to the Constitution. We're talking about an economic space here, and we're also, however, talking about an economic and political space, because it's not just about business and commerce, but it's also about um, decision-making and uh, politics. Uh, currently, we know that uh, there is a political movement in Parliament in Italy at the moment, which, as a rule, uses the Internet massively in order to engage um, with uh, citizens. So far, however, um, we have seen a free-for-all. I mean, in other words, uh, there seem to be no rules in this context, and I think something ought to be done to regulate this, because uh, so far uh, rules have been set uh, by the providers. It's hard to regulate the internet because um, it changes constantly and it grows and develops in an unpredictable fashion. But if we don't regulate, then the most powerful um, players uh, will establish their rules. We know that um, internet users uh, have to um, accept contracts uh, that are imposed upon them. Um, simply put, they couldn't use services unless they um, accept these contracts. So our effort should be that of uh, regulating um, the entire subject, starting with 
the issue of access. A colleague pointed out that Italy is um, lagging behind in this field. If we think of the internet as being a real space, as a space which every citizen should have a right to um, also in terms of being a social being, uh, at this point, it would be necessary to regulate and to make an effort to do this, um, to guarantee access. And this could be done gradually. We're not suggesting that this process should necessarily involve all states or many states at the same time. What we're saying is that gradually, just as individual countries have developed their systems guaranteeing more access in some cases, less access in the other, the idea is that gradually states could undertake to give citizens appropriate access to the internet so that they can produce, establish relations with others and uh, enjoy the various rights and facilities uh, that are available. Thank you. Now back to the speakers it's following the same order. Marco Ilesic, Giovanni Buttarelli and Guido Scorza. Grazie. Just a few words for the conclusion. Uh, I will repeat what I said an hour ago, that the Court of Justice of the European Union is not a human rights court. So it's not its principal task to defend human rights. The court was established and it keeps the role of balancing different rights as to the European law. So there is no priority to human rights. There are other human rights and other interests in the European Union, in the European Union law, that should be uh, respected. So uh, I know uh, that being a high supporter of human rights idea, it's modern and it's necessary. But you must also think of other rights that exist. And if you have a look to the Google case, I, I take it as an example, we have been balancing the two, let's say, human rights concerning individuals, Article 7 of the Charter, right to private and the private life, and Article 8, data protection, with two other rights, which are not that much close to, for, to an individual, all, all right, the Article 11, right to information and to free expression is also linked to the individual. But the right uh, existing in the Article 16, right to conduct business is more or less an economic right. So we pulled out a, a balance which in, in, at the end, brought us to the decision as it is. And I, I'm sorry, but I still find out that um, the, the judgment is not very well um, understood. For example, uh, Mr. Tomczyk, uh, uh, but, but you mentioned the right to be forgotten, which is not included in the judgment. You read it thoroughly. We never, at no place, uh, talk about this right. We didn't establish a new right. It is mentioned in the judgment as observations of the parties involved, but not at the opinion of the court. I, I am glad that uh, Mrs. Quinn understood it correctly. The only, uh, I don't understand. We, of course, we are proud or happy. We are human beings if anybody uh, likes our judgments. But we are not, it's not our function to be loved by people. We have to, to decide on not always very agreeable conflicts. And I would invite you, and I will terminate with this, 
to read together, so in order to understand it, a part of our uh, dispositive of the, uh, the judgments, the, directed, uh, the direct directives must be interpreted as meaning that the operator of a search engine is obliged to remove from the list of results displayed following, I underline, a search made on the basis of a person's name links to web page, pages published by third parties and containing information relating to that person. That's all we said. You must Google. You must remove from the list of results a search made on the basis of a person's name. name. So the idea is you can't you, it's not allowed, it's contrary to the both basic uh, rights of Article 7 and 8 of the Charter, that you can, by clicking a name of a person, get out of the search engine a complete profile of this person. But of course, the information itself, and as in the case in question, the publication of a certain uh, procedure from 15 years or 14 years ago is not touched by the case. So, as I said, I, I would like that the court would be, or it was perhaps good to, that the court would be a legislator, but it's not, and we take account of this. Thanks. Grazie. Thank you. Giovanni Bottarelli, over to you. Thank you very much, Chairperson. This has been uh, not just a very interesting debate, it's also been extremely encouraging. And many of the points uh, that uh, have been made don't need any response uh, from me. There would appear to be a widespread agreement on the nature of new rights for the protection of personal data and privacy. These could be termed as new generation rights, the full extent of which uh, uh, still remains to be seen. And these rights are linked to so-called uh, positive obligations that the European Court of Human Rights uh, has indicated as uh, being uh, um, guaranteed by the Convention. So both on account of the European Convention on Human Rights and on account of the Lisbon Treaty, not only is there the obligation to be proportional in introducing limitations to these rights, but it is also necessary to act positively through the combined uh, effect of both regulations and actions on the part of the competent authorities so as to establish the necessary premises for um, the development uh, of these rights and avoid uh, their further erosion. Another conclusion is that these rights are not absolute, but obviously they require um, an adequate balance with other freedoms, uh, such as freedom of expression and uh, other rights and duties, rather, that uh, are the result uh, of uh, our being part of a community. One third consideration is that the so-called right to be let alone is um, really something uh, of the past. If we think of administering all our life, uh, managing our lives through tablets and smart loaves, smartphones, and uh, doing that with uh, e-government. The idea of being on our own, left alone in such a m modern contemporary world is um, rather far-fetched. And so it's not so much a question of um, being able to express consent in all cases, but 
supervision to allow uh, citizens to um, ex undertake carry out control dynamically in order to um, see whether the use of the data goes beyond a certain threshold or uh, clashes with the principles which uh, will need to uh, establish a minimum common denominator. I also um, heard with great satisfaction the comment of a number of delegates who um, said that substantial and procedural clarity is required, both, required, both with regard to protective measures and uh, with regard to any waivers or exceptions. And this uh, clarity also has to apply to the protection of other, of other rights. And uh, cyberbullying uh, was a very good uh, point in case. On our website, we've um, carried out an analysis on the interaction between cyberbullying and the protection of um, children and the protection of data um, in a wider sense. And to answer the points made by the chair with regard to the Google case, I, I agree uh, completely with the opinion of the previous speaker. This um, uh, judgment did not introduce ex novo the right to be forgotten, which did exist in our country's legislations uh, in differing ways. It's certainly not something which has emerged because of the um, decision. The decision uh, contains a number of points which are already supported by the data protection agencies, but uh, perhaps the only innovative point is the possibility for a person involved to con contact Google directly without needing to uh, pass th to go through a contact with the so-called um, a source uh, site of the uh, information and uh, it will be I think that anybody providing uh, search engine uh, services in the world should have to be um, do this in compliance with our rules and principles and there is a global need for uh, protection and this reminds us of all the scenarios we've outlined uh, in looking for the best uh, possible global solution, but uh, Europe will not be able to um, advance any credible solution internationally unless it itself is credible in uh, removing the uh, currently unsustainable uh, situation of fragmentation it has in its midst and approve a reform which would uh, place us um, on a, in a very weak status internationally. A number of uh, third, so-called third world countries are looking with great interest at uh, what Europe is uh, deciding. Our model will have an effect on many countries in uh, the APEC area and many African countries which are now uh, beginning to address uh, the issue of data protection and um, important players like Japan who are now um, in the process of updating their legislation. Uh, this uh, attention is not always visible, but I can assure you that uh, there is a constant focus on our debate in the United States. Only through the approval of this reform will Europe, as you said, uh, Chair, become a credible leader in international negotiations and uh, be able to hold more effective discussions with strategic partners like the United States. Uh, five or six uh, important uh, regulatory packages, including framework agreement with law enforcement bodies, the Treaty on uh, Trade and Partnership, the f future of the so-called uh, US Safe Harbor, and the apparently bilateral agreements such as uh, air uh, travel and financial transactions which um, in actual fact when dealt with um, 
will have a planetary effect. And so despite the need to improve some of the provisions of the reform, uh, certainly with regard to clarity, we can only exhort uh, the European institutions to um, approve it, adopt it, and begin to apply it, and uh, particularly use it for a more global solution. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Scott. It's a privilege, um, within a privilege, being the last speaker in a, such an interesting debate. And I must say that um, I take note of the fact that uh, there is a European genetic, um, uh, there are European genetic assets in the area of um, the protection of human rights. When we speak of uh, fundamental human rights online, uh, these can be recognized. This should make it... Uh, uh, make the path of that uh, draft declaration of internet fundamental rights easier. Two comments, and really two, just bef before I, I, I thank you. Uh, the first one is that I believe that it has uh, come out from a number of speakers that uh, often in the public um, arena uh, on the internet, there's been the affirmation of a um, fundamental right followed by a necessary limitation of another fundamental right of uh, human beings and citizens. There is a constant uh, activity of balancing uh, um, fundamental rights, uh, which um, applies and my impression is independently of the future of the Bill of Rights that for internet it will be essential that the various actors who will be um, taking uh, responsibility for the implementation of these measures in the European Union succeed in holding a substantial and positive dialogue because I think there's nothing worse than an uh, immediate uh, future of um, uh, excessive protections of certain uh, rights to the damage of others. And one consideration on the question the chair was putting with regard to the relationship with the rest of the world uh, on the other side of the Atlantic, um, it's clear that there is um, some cultural uh, difference in with regard to the fundamental rights of human beings and citizens. Uh, on the two sides of the Atlantic without saying that one culture is better than another. Uh, perhaps in recent months and recent years, at times we've seen uh, positions being taken which were adversarial. Perhaps if it were possible to uh, synthesize positions and uh, finding an encounter in future years, we need to stress uh, the idea of being for, for, for something, because Internet is also a global forum where the uh, moments and reasons for contact uh, outweigh anything else. So um, even if uh, we have a Europe protecting the fundamental rights of its own citizens, I don't think that we want to look to a Europe which uh, enters into a clash of cultures or even civilizations with uh, the other side of the Atlantic. Um, what I would like to see is a Europe which makes use of its own history to try to share in the interests of all citizens of the planet the common genetic heritage of uh, rights of uh, human beings, which I heard um, advocate so forcefully today. Thank you. 
So it's been a very long day for all of us, and we've uh, finally reached the end. And I wish to thank the keynote speakers, the discussants, and all those who um, for for the um, important uh, input. A few housekeeping announcements. There will now be a. Um, Drinks will be offered in the corridor outside where we had the coffee break, and then we have a um, dinner offered at the restaurant of the Chamber of Deputies on the ground floor. Uh, tomorrow morning we'll be beginning at nine o'clock. As you know, we have a very busy schedule tomorrow, and so we would like to urge everybody to be here on time so that we can um, really uh, have enough time to focus on the discussions tomorrow morning, which are uh, devoted to equally important um, questions. Thank you.